You're listening to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast. And away we go. Welcome back to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast. It's the only one that brings the kitchen table to you. You might be asking, Coops, why are you talking so quietly? Because <laughs> Pete yelled at me in the pre-show that I made too much noise. So now this you're going to calmer. This is the more high reserved. energy Coops. You got to get calm and more reserved. Coops. It is nice, though, actually. actually. Because, it is really you know, nice. Because, it's uh, nice. I was getting on Pete and Ruffy's nerves, so... See, you can actually hear the the, light, the wildlife outside. It's so a nice from night. now on, this is what you're going to get because this is what Pete wants. He wants to be. He wants That's to what I need. Better. I need high energy coops on so the show, not in the pre-show. To the show, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, dickhead. It's, it's the only podcast that brings the firehouse kitchen table to you. Hey, Ruff, you, how are you doing today? Hey, buddy. You dick. How are you? What's up, buddy? I got the Gupalini Gupalini on. Oh, you do it. Pete, how are you this evening, buddy? <laughs> uh, I'm feeling... <laughs> Procaccini said the getting sleepy podcast. Yeah. Ruffy! Ruffy! You know so, Ruff, how's that? it going, Ruff? I say, fuck that. You're getting this all the time, Pete. So, stick it where the sun don't shine, fella. This is the guy you get 24-7, seven days a week. Ruffy! 365. This is what you're getting. And away we go. Welcome back. Love that nation to the Get Salty Space Podcast. It's the only one in the whole wide world. That brings the kitchen table to you. You, 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 you. I see you. Johnny Lodge, I see you. Alex Stillman, <laughs> Gonzo, Burnbox, Darren DeFries. I see all of you in there. That's what I say. That's what you're getting from here on in. My Where's word? the peacap? You forgot the peacap. I left it upstairs. My son made me some exotic drink. My my son Lucas, he's ten. He loves to cook. And me, I said, make me something good. I don't know what he was doing. I saw bottles pouring this and pouring alcohol? that. So alcohol. I don't know what else. Put lime juice. He's putting this in, that in. So oh, he's like going old school. He's got the bitters going. He's got everything. You don't know what you're gonna get going. <clears> man. <throat> you have no idea. Old yeah. fashioned. Mm -hmm. All right. What's going on, boys? So that's where we're at. Lou's got the Cupolini on tonight. Are you freezing, Lou? No. But I What's figured, the temperature uh, I up there? 36, maybe. Ooh. Oh, what do you I got heard the heat? They, Buffalo's so what do you getting got the like... heat set at a balmy 58? What's the heat set? <laughs> <laughs> Don't go Believe crazy. It not, Believe it or not, it's usually too warm in here, actually. Really? What? Yeah, it's always like 70 or something. 70's wow. too warm. Okay. Yeah, it's too warm. Mm. Wow. Yeah, this uh, Buffalo is supposed to get six feet of snow, man. That's insane. That's crazy. I mean, talk. they always get snow, but this seems a little Six early. Feet. To start. Six feet this early? Wow. That's not good. Getting a little tired of the snow. I mean, I enjoy snow, but <laughs> you better stop moving to Florida. Look, I was gonna say, well, we just had two inches or an inch to two the other day. It was nice, did? But it melted. Yeah. Oh. Uh, huh. No good. We got another guy, the guy coming on tonight. He's up from your nape of the neck, neck of the woods, step of the neck. Oh, he's neck. a little north. <laughs> he's a little further north than you. Albany's about two hours from here. Oh, and they're really? just outside of Albany. If, if you go to Florida, if you buy a house in Florida, you bring those curtains with you. <laughs> Pete, what are you laughing at? Oh, uh, Nothing. I'm just thinking. <laughs> I'm looking at my. Uh, I'm looking at my uh, my soundboard, and then this this one came up. Me so horny. Oh, you must. Oh, love you Me a long so time. Horny. From the other mm. night, you know, when we uh, whenever we uh, reference the. Uh, the nom stuff from now on, I got that one in there. So there it is. You do. Right. Yeah, another military guy. Oh, Ooh. this guy. You know what? Sometimes you just get a good vibe in the pre-show. I yeah. got a good vibe about some good stories. Military stories, fire stories. His kids. His, his kids, kids are in the yeah. job. His kids are in the military. Kids are in the military. Pete was like this. Pete had a ball. Kids attack Pete, dude. You don't know what that is. That's serious business. Are you speaking like, English? What'd you just say? Like slide on the that's pin. like uh no, that's like uh that's like being in one of the rescues, I guess, but only like it's way, right way harder to get in. It's yeah. way harder the to F get in. At the Air Force? Yeah, yeah. They're the ones who like they are get attached to Green Berets, they get attached to Navy SEALs, what, and then PJs? they call in not, the airstrikes, you know. They get on the PJs. radio. No, tack PJ. PJs save okay. people's asses. When, oh. uh, 
That's what the, John, Johnny Hopkins is. Uh, our so our saying, old lieutenant thank is God, a PJ. Thank God we still have these guys. Is what yes. Oh, thank yeah, God. they're definitely not. Thank they're definitely God. not binary or gender fluid, and they don't have like unicorn hair and stuff like that. They're like mm. men. There's a few men that are left actually on the earth that right. we have. This guy's got That's testosterone, good. no question. Good, good, if he's good. doing that job, good. No they joke. don't. Uh, if they see a fire on the block, they don't run the other way, do they? <laughs> no, not like me. I run. No. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. I, listen, I got so a low. I got a low. I got a, I got a low test. You know what I'm saying? I got a low test. All right. So let me ask you this. So we know how you feel about fires, but like you're a gun guy. So if you mm -hmm. saw somebody with a gun and you had a gun, would you still run the other way? I'd like, blast them if I had the uh, if I had the right. All right. Um, well, that's what the, I want. The tactical to advantage for sure. Right. No question. Well, there is one half a ball in there somewhere, maybe. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> one half a ball. <laughs> Uh, Everybody you, needs I'll, tell you, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you some stories. I'll tell you some stories. Oh, that's right. He'll grapple your ass. I forgot. Yeah, he'll throw you in a tie you up like a pretzel, I just, bro. Yeah, I don't like the idea of burning to death, but I'd rather be shot. I, I really would. If I had to pick one, yeah, I All definitely right. would take getting shot. No question. Hmm. Mm. He might yeah. look like the mild matted producer, but <laughs> deep down he's a badass jujitsu bite you up like a pretzel. He won't shoot wrap you with the shit up. seven yeah. on the seventeenth slide on the nine. He'll fucking listen. Do some business. <laughs> Best way avoid punch. No be there, Daniel son. Oh, oh wow! Yeah. You got big muscle. Oh, you walk out. Oh. He's so horny. He's so he's horny. I knew it. I knew it was coming. <laughs> He's so horny. <laughs> I don't know why. I just had to. I don't right. know. That was a good one. Classic. All right. All right. Do what you got to do. We got to make some money here, bro. Uh, yeah, no problem. Actually, tonight's a, a short one, a, a little bit amended in the beginning. Uh, but we do have, of course, gettingsaltyapparel.com, guys. Gettingsaltyapparel.com, where you get uh, all the t shirts, hoodies, the hats, the tumblers like this one. And guess what? It's right around Christmas, right? We're getting close. Uh. We're getting close. And maybe let's just say you want to get this tumbler engraved right here. You know who's going to engrave it? That guy. This right guy. There. Yep. Yeah. So you know what? Um, look at the site. There's all kinds of little tchotchkes, all kinds of cool stuff. You got the uh, the Hearst Tool nail clippers. You got the uh, cigar cutter, uh, partner store cigar cutter. You got all kinds of wonderful you things. I'm getting salty. If you got a fireman in your family, we got it for you. Right, Roof? We do. Now we got to do uh, embroidered hat. Did you put it on the website yet? Oh, uh, I did not. They're right. cool too. Coming First, do at your old lady's box, and which one? Everything will kill you. Is it? Lux. Lux got nothing ah, to do with it. Lux got nothing to do with it. Yeah, those are the good, uh, two mm. very good uh, designs. So definitely check us out at gettingsaltyapparel.com. Also, guys, real quick. If you're in the chat tonight, throw us a few shekels if you so deem so. Uh, in the super chat, if you absolutely, positively have a question you have to ask uh, Chief Miter, make sure it's on target with what we're talking about. Let's not make it a you know question about, you know, did you know Timmy Smith from Rescue 4? And when he's like talking about his 9-11 story or something, God forbid. You know what I mean? That's not uh, mm. That's not on target. You know what I'm saying? Let's keep it. Relevant. Uh, super chat, guys. We appreciate every shekel. And uh, that's it. You know who's coming in shit hot? Who? Dan Wilson Jr. Oh, he's coming always in coming in shit hot. He What's hasn't he been say? in the chat in a while, bro. You know who's well, not coming in shit hot? He's an upstate guy. That's why. Now he's all like this, you know, with the Troy guys. You know? Oh, oh I already got an email from him. I got an email from him. Yeah. You know who's not coming in shit hot is uh, Fat Daddy Ray. He's got a bad knee. I don't know what's going on with him. You see that on Facebook? Yeah, I did with that his low knee or his high knee. <laughs> oh, I high asked him. Knee. <laughs> I asked him if he blew it out uh, running you over in that hallway. That. That, time. <laughs> yeah, that was in a hallway. It was in a. It was in a commercial building, in a barber oh shop. God. Oh my god! Yeah, all, he blasted all, you. All three hundred pounds of fat daddy steamrolled me. He probably twisted his knee, and now he's paying Ooh. the price. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. All right. So that's it. Let's let, let's get him in here. Let, let, let's let, 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 let's get him in here. This is a man's man, everybody. Let's go. Yep. Let's, he is a man's man. A military guy all the way up to chief. Troy the fire department. Got deployed to Iraq. We got loads of stories. Let's bring him in here. Captain Tom. Oh, not Captain Tom Miter. Chief Tom Miter. Bring him in here. Yeah, don't get it wrong. Oh, man. <laughs> Look at him. Still looking good. He just retired. Son of a bitch. Had a fabulous head of hair, bro. 
Good thank you, really thank you, Zeke, in the Look chat for Troy. Thank you, thank you for Troy. For Troy, well, come on, man. Come on, Troy. <laughs> Good to have you, Chief. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm uh, I'm honored that you guys wanted to to have me on the show. It's just it's great. Thank you. We're us three idiots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the show's just starting. I don't know who's going to be the idiot. Yeah, by man, so. uh, yeah. I can I can guarantee you it's me. Uh, we'll move on from that though. <laughs> you know what, Pete? Yep. That takes a lot to say that, bro. I appreciate that. <laughs> I That's took it out of your hands. Yeah. <laughs> now you're learning. Now you're learning. Take, Take it, it up, bro. Take it out of your hands. Eat, embrace the suck, as they say. Well, yes. how about we don't suck and let's do the Pledge of Allegiance since we're such a patriotic show yeah. and an America-loving show. All right, yeah. guys? So and we, got a, we have a, a, a vet here, bro. We got a, a military guy. Absolutely, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. The Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Fabulous. You gotta hide that guy. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Hey, before we go any further, let's get our drunken buddies. Let's get our drunken fans. Ooh. Let's give them something to. Uh, let's give them the word of the day. Well, you know what? Let, let me explain the word of the day for our new listeners, because every week we get new ones. Mm. If you haven't watched the show Ooh. yet, this is a tradition we've been doing since I close to day one, I think, uh, which is called the word of the day. Every time you hear the word of the day, you'll hear a horn sound, and when you do, it's time to drink. If you feel like it, if you don't, don't. But All if right. you do. We try to get you a little buzz on the show. Ooh. All right. So today's word of the day is long sleeve. Ooh. There What's it is. Behind that? Anybody want to share that? What's, yeah, the, what's whole... the story with the long sleeves? A little birdie told me. You want me to tell a lure? Yeah, you yeah. Tell? No, you tell me. Uh, so, uh, well, I'm a military guy, right? So uh, when I came on a job, uniforms were a big deal. The chief we had... Uh, he was really big on wearing a proper uniform. We got uh, short sleeve shirts from uh, May 1st to October 1st. And then we got long sleeve shirts uh, from October nice. 1st back uh, back around to uh, April 30th. And, uh, you know, to, to very I have very I would say I have very few quirks in a firehouse, but that was one of them where to write shirt. And uh, so the nickname very quickly on my shift became Daddy Long Sleeves. Was my nice. <laughs> Mostly because my son Justin on a job it, it, is, you know, here, here comes Daddy Long Sleeves. Everybody get the right shirt. That's, so that's twice. Huh? That's twice. Oh, no, right? I'll right. drink. You know what's so funny, Chief? Is, Sorry. Uh, is that everybody has their little thing, right? Whatever it is, it just is their pet peeve, right? You grew up, yes. you know, that's what you grew up with, with that right. chief and you carried it on and, uh, you know, maybe somebody will carry it on for you too. Yeah. Now, I know a certain guy who demands black socks. Just saying, you know, <laughs> <laughs> a certain uh, chief may be related to me. Maybe he, maybe it rhymed with Steve Kubler. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey chief, what are you drinking there? You were, you were mentioning it, uh, in a pre-show. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, drinking, uh, Brown's Cherry Raspberry Ale, or they call it Cherry Raz, from Brown's Brewery in downtown Troy, best brewery in the world. Been around for 30 plus years. Uh, that's their biggest selling uh, beer. And uh, we go there all the time. And if anybody's nice. coming to Troy and you don't go to Brown's, well, I feel bad for you because you need to What's go to Brown's. Brown's. What, what can Brown do for you? Well, well, <laughs> it gets you look pretty buzzed. <laughs> do they do they serve food in there too? Just oh, yeah. Yeah, they have a great restaurant. My, my wife and I actually ate dinner there last night. So, uh, yeah, wasn't that was nice of the chief to invite us out there, Luke? It was, man. Pick oh, up what a nice guy. I can't even believe it. Yeah, I'll get what? my You're picking up the tab. I'm driving. <laughs> now, my son nominated me. He's got to pay. So, oh, all right. Yeah, we'll get wow. him. We should get him anyway. He's still yeah. on. You're so, on a fixed income, chief, now. You know what I mean? Right. I know. I am. We can't oh, get him man. to pay. We'll try to get Pete to pay. <laughs> what? What? Wait, what? Who? What? Who? What? Who? Pete, what? what are you, a fucking owl? <laughs> what are you, an owl? Pete's All the right. opposite of long sleeves. He's short arms. <laughs> T Rex arms. <laughs> All right, so let's go, Pete. We got some early pictures of the Chief. We'll start with childhood interest. Why don't you, oh, Chief, why don't you tell, oh, look at that guy. Who's that in there? Hey, oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, well, that the pictures uh, after I, I'll get to that in a second. That's a program I was on in high school. 
uh, that brought me to the firehouse. But uh, I, uh, my interest started when uh, my uncle, his name was Mike Harrison. He's passed away now, but uh, he, he got on a job in uh, October of 67. So I was about five years old. And uh, the first time my, my dad or my mom, I don't even remember which, took me down to the firehouse with my brothers and, and uh, sister. And uh, he, you know, showed us those trucks and he went down at that brass pole there from uh, the second floor of the old headquarters building on State Street. I was hooked. I was definitely hooked at uh, right then and there. And uh, it just, just continued on. I never lost uh, lost my love or my interest for it. My, I taught my parents into buying me a scanner, you know, the old crystal type. We had to go to radio. Holy shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I made them buy me one of those for Christmas one year so I could listen to it. And then um, I got really lucky uh, when I went to I went to Catholic Central High School in the north section of Troy in the Lansingburg section. And uh, they had a program called the uh, Career Investigation Program. And uh, I signed up for it and uh, I got to go to the firehouse for 13 weeks at a second semester of school instead of going to uh, wow. school. Wow. Come on. Yeah. Is that, yeah. that what that picture is? You had to have all your uh, credits for graduation the first semester. So I, I somehow pulled that off. I think my mom pushed me pretty hard. And uh, so I got to do that. And it was a, the real deal. You had to go, uh, you had to dress up in wow. a suit and tie. You had to go down for an interview with the chief. You had to bring a resume. And uh, that. And, and I was really shy when I was a kid. And you'll find out on this show, I'm, I'm not really shy anymore. I'll talk your ass off. <laughs> and uh but I, uh, I went down for the interview and I was pretty shy and I got in there. And my, the last thing my uncle said to me before I went into the interview was don't the, the chief's name was uh, Bill Phoenix. He said, don't tell Chief Phoenix uh, that I'm your uncle because he had re uh, until recently had been the UFA president. And they were, you know, locking heads pretty good. Uh. And uh, so being the idiot that I am, I get in there and he says, well, you know, what's your connection to the fire department? And I immediately blurted out. Oh boy. Well, my uncle Mike's a captain. <laughs> and who's your uncle Yo, Mike? You know, Mike Harrison. And uh, and he just leaned over, yelled out his door, Tom, called the deputy chief, guy named Tom Nash, who would scare the shit out of anybody. He was clean cut, Marine Corps like, creases in the shirt, the tie, the, the collar brass, a whole nine yards. And he comes in, he says, This new kid from we because they had a, a a, a, a guy a year before who also became a Troy fireman, Tommy scores own. So we got another kid from that program from Catholic guy and it's Harrison's nephew. So he's all yours. And Nashie just nodded and took me out of the chief's office. And that was the last conversation I ever had with chief Phoenix. Oh boy. Uh, so and what Nashie, happened to, what happened to, Hey, don't tell me my uncle, you folded like a cheat. Uh, like a, like a cheap <laughs> I, was 18, man. <laughs> I was 17. Hey, I was 17. Do. Do don't tell him that way. I did it. I did it. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be me. Peter, so we have a few pictures of my dad. Yeah, so so Nash, he ran the whole thing and uh and there it was there was work. I had to go back to school every Friday and turn in a uh a paper on what I'd learned that week. So uh so Nash he took me around to all the firehouses. He'd send me a week here and a week there. He sent me for three weeks to the the firehouse my uncle was at, which was uh engine two at the time, was where he was, which is up by the RPI campus, Louie we were talking about before. Uh that's where that firehouse is. And I got to go there for three weeks and, uh, I met, uh, so many great guys. Uh, Phil Quant taught me a lot. A guy named Jack McGrath who's recently passed away, taught me a lot. They didn't let me sit in the firehouse and just, you know, you, you, you get a kid come in, it's buffing the job. You, they come in, they sit in a chair and they just tell you, you know, be quiet. And they, that wasn't how it was. I learned how to load hose. I learned how to change bottles for guys at fires. I learned how to, uh, how they lay lines. I learned how to, how to use the pumper. They, you know, well, they you would take, you would take it in the runs then with them. What's that? Pete? You would take it in the runs with them then you, uh, I, you know, that's a funny story in itself. Um, I was not allowed to ride the rig and uh, we're pretty sure that was a chief. Yeah. Right. Allegedly <laughs> I wasn't allowed to ride the rig. That was a chief Phoenix thing said you can't ride the rig. And my uncle was pretty sure that was a shot at him. But, uh, you know, those that was just how it was in those days. And that's your uncle yeah, right there? That's Uncle Mike when he was a battalion chief later on. Yeah, yeah. He was my battalion chief, which was even better. Wow, that's pretty and, cool. Uh, yeah. So, but the, the funniest story I got there, so Chief Nash took me to a different firehouse for a week. He would meet me at each firehouse he sent me to on a Monday morning, give the captain a rundown. The kids got to learn stuff. You can't just leave them alone. Um, and then he would say, Phoenix says he can't ride the rig. So, there was a captain at Engine 1 who I'll talk about a lot later because he was a great friend and a great guy. Harry Down had his big booming voice. And, you know, Chief Nash is like, Harry, you can't let the kid ride the rig. And Phoenix doesn't want him on the pumper. And Harry's like, yeah, yeah all right, Chief. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
Nash, he left. He got about two blocks away, and Harry said, get on a rig, kid. We're going shopping. So <laughs> out the door we went. So, you know, I can say it now because it was 40, 42 years ago, but uh, that's that was my first uh, – my first now, ride. You, you used to just throw it on days, or you would do any nights, or just days? Not initially. No, during the program, I was on days. I was there from uh, like eight to four every day from the be from the beginning of the tour till till four o'clock in the afternoon, and then I could go home. And then after the program was over, like anybody else, I started just hanging out at two with my uncle and his crew because they were all just great guys, and they took good care of me. And uh, I started being able to, to, to spend a night, you know, they had empty bunks so I could spend a night, but wow. I couldn't, you know, I still couldn't ride the rig. So once I got my own car, if, if something decent came in, I would just, you know, drive to the scene and help out as best that, that they let me do. So it was great. Two it things great. real quick, not to interrupt, but Beansy, yeah. Beansy, I'm assuming you know who Beansy is. I know who Beansy is. Beansy yes. says everyone at the hall has their long sleeves on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is past October first, boy. So yeah. Yep. And I just want to take a moment to uh, to thank uh, the Burn Box uh, once again for being such a great supporter of the show. Good evening, Burn Box, and uh, he wanted to give a shout out to Daddy Long Sleeves. So there. Oh. We go. Oh boy, we're in trouble tonight. We're gonna have a quite a night. So, so Chief, the, you you really had the benefit, not only just learning the job, but getting all these guys like input that went, and you weren't even on the job yet. Right. I mean, that oh, was, yeah. a, that was yeah. a big thing. Yeah. They, they were uh, incredible. I said, especially Phil, Phil Quant, he's still a friend of mine. I bowl with him on Tuesday nights. Uh, he did a lot for me. Uh, these guys, they were so great. When I enlisted in the air force, these, these guys took me out for, and had a party for him for a going away party for him. These guys were wow. on the job. I was just a kid hanging around a firehouse and they, they, they threw a party for me. They're pretty cool you guys. guys. Uh, you guys don't bowl at the bowling alley that you burnt down, did you? No, but the, <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. I wanted that. The, side. Uh, the Stevens family, where we do bowl, uh, his Dave Stevens Sr. is one of my best friends. His family owns Hilltop Bowl. And uh, strangely enough, I'm pretty sure they're happy that that, that we did yeah, pretty yeah, good. No, 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 no. All of a sudden, Hilltop Bowl is doing pretty yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Where, where, where yeah, that that yeah no uh, problem. Dude, bro, hey, Bowen Steve, Alley's. Where were you? Was I at, think Bowen Alley's are in the top. Turning off hydrants. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, nice. <laughs> Bowen Alley's oh, are definitely gosh. in the top two that uh, yeah. Bowen Alley should take a beating at. Holy shit. That was a that was a big job. We'll we'll get to that. We'll get to that one. Yeah. Uh, what the hell? I, I want to see that picture of, of his uncle with the uh oh I know I got you I got you yeah, yeah. Which one? yeah I know what you got oh yeah. the chief <laughs> the tonka the tonka yeah, so Buffalo. Buffalo. My, my, my uncle Mike he was uh he was a character within a character he was he was out there he uh he I think if if he if he got in trouble for anything upstairs as we call it is because he stayed pretty close to the guys he stayed very close to the guys we would have uh, two hand touch football games out in the middle of State Street at night. We would uh, play this wiffle ball home run derby that these guys came up with these elaborate rules for that we used to play in the summertime and in front. And, and there was a point once where there was a chief that he, he wasn't particularly getting along with at the time, a higher ranking chief that uh, had ordered us not to do that. And one night, uh, one of the boys noticed that that particular chief was uh, hanging out up the hill, kind of watching to see if we went out. And my uncle, being my uncle, he ordered us all out to play home run derby in the street because just because that she told us just he, because he, he, yeah. that was, that because. was how Uncle Mike was. He was he was a character to, to the bitter Pete, end. He was a character. That's that's two balls, Pete. That that's when you got the two. That's when you go right <laughs> oh, out. And you play. Oh, you it's not the one. You don't have one or half. You go right out with you the, order the men with you're both of your balls. No uniball. No uniball here. <laughs> Okay. I just want to say too, when Shut Uncle Mike up. retired, it was silly woman and chief and him. They became very close friends after he retired. So really? it wasn't like the real. That's funny. It wasn't like that. They How many just years did he do, Uncle. chief? What's that? How many years did he do? Uncle Mike did. I think twenty-seven. He came on late. He was twenty-nine when he came on. So oh, that was pretty right. much. You know how those days were. That was right. pretty much it. If he didn't get on by thirty, he was done. So that, was he uh, on your mother's side or your father's side? Yeah, he was my mom's younger brother. Yeah. Okay. And nobody yeah. else on the job? Just him? Uh, no, just him. And then uh, my grandfather, my dad's father was the city's public safety commissioner when I was about the time I was born. So I don't remember mm -hmm. when he did that. And that's basically a combination of what you guys have a police and a fire commissioner. It's mm -hmm. kind of one guy that just handles administrative stuff and discipline and hiring and firing and all that. And my, my grandfather did that for a while. 
but that was I was so little I don't even remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, would have been nice to have him around when you got on the job. Maybe get you somewhere. Yeah, you know, he was. By the time I got on, uh, my grandfather was long past away. <laughs> <laughs> when you, when, what year was that that you were doing the high school thing? The seventies. That would have been uh, the uh, winter of nineteen eighty. Uh, I started it in uh, the end of January nineteen eighty, and completed it in uh, the late spring, and then went gotcha. back to school for like a month of doing pretty much absolutely nothing, and then graduated. So, so did you have a lot of Vietnam vets you worked with? Oh. Almost, uh, I wouldn't say exclusively, but yeah, a, a tremendous mm. amount. And you got you guys know how that goes. They they really talked about it. Right. Um, one, one guy that I'll you'll you'll see a picture of at some point here, Terry Fox, was my captain right before I got promoted. He was a very very highly decorated Vietnam vet. Was a Marine Corps helicopter crew chief, and I can't remember if it was the Distinguished Flying Cross or what what it was, but it was like a very very high award. But he. Uh, he ain't like six guys, six feet up in the air off of a hilltop back into the helicopter under fire in uh, Vietnam. And incredible, incredible thing he did. And he was yeah. a great fireman and uh, a great guy. He's still around. I don't see him too often, but his name was Terry Fox. We called him Foxy. Great guy. Great fireman. Uh, he could. You think I could talk? This show goes to <laughs> four o'clock. Hey, Coombs. 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 Yeah. Again. Two balls right there again. Oh, you know yeah. I'm saying? There's a lot of balls flying around here. This is yeah. what I'm saying. You know what I mean? Well, it's like almost like either driving a unicycle or a bicycle. You know what I mean? You know, with one ball, you with two balls. You know? Pete's a unicycle guy, I think. <laughs> yes, right now, right, right now he's texting somebody. I don't know who he's texting on the phone. Uh, it's a work thing for the morning, unfortunately. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. No worries. Are we you want us to stop? Are we good? Yeah, you know what? Uh, Thanks, guys, for joining us tonight. <laughs> Keith Miter, it's been a great show. He's uh, got to get up early in the morning. Yeah, so, a real uh, early one. Sorry about that. <laughs> God damn it. All right, so let's go. Before you get on the job, you enlisted in the Air Force, 1981. Yeah, so it, I wanted to. Obviously, I wanted to take the test to get on Troy, and I wasn't quite old enough. You had to be 20 back then to take it. I was only 19. So I did sign up to take Albany's exam because you only had to be 18. But allegedly, as you guys like to say, I lied about my address. Uh -oh. and uh, They caught me and they tossed me off the list. So I enlisted in the Air Force. So I'm not going to sit around you know, working in a hospital kitchen or something for the next four years. So I enlisted in the Air Force at that point. Why the Air Force over anything else? Because the Air Force uh, were the only ones, and I, I give my dad all this credit because when I told him what I was interested in doing, he said, well, don't enlist anywhere that won't give you a guaranteed job as a firefighter. And right. the Air Force was the only branch of service that said, yes, we will absolutely make you a firefighter. So I had to go on what mm -hmm. they called the delayed enlistment program. I had to actually wait about eight months before I actually left. So I actually left in March of 82, but that guaranteed me a position as a firefighter. So it's better food and equipment. Yeah, you know, you can uh, you know, you can join the uh, Marine Corps and live in a foxhole, you can join the Navy, live in a ship, you can join the Army, live in a tent, or you can join the Air Force and live in a Holiday Inn. It's entirely your choice. Oh, oh my I god. Like that. <laughs> oh my wow. god. All right. I like that, man. Nice. <laughs> Definitely not a mistake. No. 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 It was you... the best decision I ever made for a multitude of reasons. But it was it was fun. It was interesting and uh I uh I got to do a lot of things that I probably never would have got to do. Went to a, a place that I had never even heard of before. I wasn't that great at geography. I went to the uh, Upper Peninsula of Michigan to K.I. Sawyer Air Force Base after I graduated from the uh, Air Force Fire Academy at Chnut Air Force Base in Illinois. So good time. It was a lot oh, of fun. So you, you went right in there, right to the Fire Academy then? So I went to basic training for six weeks like everybody else. Right. And, uh, you know, I got in a little bit of trouble there. I was supposed to be the dorm fire monitor. And one morning, a fire alarm went off, and they had just made me to monitor the night before because <laughs> they fired the guy before that for making some stupid mistake. And so the fire alarm went off right about the time they were calling Reveille, and I really didn't know what to do. So I got everybody to go out the, the door like they're supposed to. And then uh, the one guy left, what they call the dorm guard, says, well, what do we do now? And I'm like, I don't know. I guess we leave. <laughs> so we left. We went downstairs with the other 10,000 guys in the street and because uh, it was a big that they called an RH and T dorm. So there was a ton of what they call flights, tons of people in the building, this huge building, and everybody has to clear out. Well, it turns out that if you're, if the fire monitor is supposed to hold the uh, fire escape door open and stand by it to let the fire department, the, the actual responding fire department know that, uh, that the fire did not originate in your dorm. And I didn't do that. 
I went outside. So the next thing you know, they're all laying lines and putting they on make a search. Yeah, yeah. Upstairs and finding nothing. And uh, the miss you is somebody screaming, Miner! From, you know, <laughs> know, hundreds of guys, hundreds of kids. Oh, oh my God. God. Every TI in Lackland Air Force Miner. Base was screaming at me. Did they <laughs> take away your fire duty nope, at that point? Nope, no, nope. my, uh, my TI kind of came to my rescue. He's, when he was done screaming at me, he said, well, we did just make him the fire monitor last night about five minutes before lights out. So he didn't even get a chance to read the oh, manual. So shit, we're talking about the front of the wolves. So they, they let me You're off like, the hook. Minor, you fucked up! <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard that a lot throughout my career. <laughs> no, even, even recently before my retirement. There's got to be something wrong, though, right? If you if you don't hear that, I'm yeah, assuming. Yeah, right? so, yeah. My uncle always used to say, if, you know, you're going to get yelled at if you're doing something, but if you're not doing anything, you're, you know, if you want to get yelled at, then don't do anything, and everybody's just going to think you're a shitbird. So <laughs> better to do something and get yelled at than yeah. not do anything at all. You, you got to step up to fuck up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the TI was great, though. I, I still remember his name, Sergeant Lipscomb. He, at the end of basic training, he goes through this little file he had of all your, your mistakes. He pulls out the little form that had my mistake on it. He looks at me, he goes, what are you, you know, what are you, what are you doing now that, when you graduate, where are you going to, uh, what's your job going to be? And I said, uh, I'm going to be a firefighter. <laughs> and he said, God help us all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Weren't you the guy that fucked up? Yeah, he knew. <laughs> he knew. <laughs> oh, it was pretty funny. But yeah, so then I went up to Chinook Air Force Base uh, in Rantoul or Champaign, Illinois, right outside, about 60 miles outside Chicago, I think it was. Went to the fire academy there. Didn't get any big trouble there. And uh, then I went up to KISR and spent the next four years up there in the, the harsh UP. So wow, cold up there. Very. Uh, it would be so bad that in uh, in the winter time, when I was on the pumper, we didn't have we didn't have jump seats or anything. We were still riding a backstepper with the Air Force calls a tailboard. And uh, originally, we didn't even have like safety straps. We had this bar that that hinged down behind you. And like if we were just cruising around a base during the day, we would turn around face backwards and just lean on the bar. You know, like like we're hanging around at a bar. And uh, but in the wintertime, when it got cold, they put us in what they call the ramp truck was just a pickup truck with a couple of big fire extinguishers, skid loads on it. And we followed the pumper to wherever the call was. But it was just it was unbearably cold. It snowed one year for 27 days straight. We're marking the the windows. Definitely. uh, Definitely needed long sleeves up there. Oh, yeah. Uh, Not good. Not good. Yeah, definitely needed long sleeves up there. So, so you you uh so you're up there being a firefighter, right? Yep. Which is yep. what you really wanted to do. And uh you come down, you said to take the test in 84. 84. Yeah, the test was like I I uh so the, the cool thing about being in the military is you can make your legal address anywhere in the country you want. And ah. it's, it's not a question. So my parents actually lived, you had to be a city resident to get on a job. You could take the test if you weren't a city resident, but city residents got preference. And my mom and dad had moved to Brunswick by then, so out, out which is a little town just outside the city. So I made my best friend at the time's house, my uh, in the city, Mike Keller, who who's also a fireman and a battalion chief. I made his house my uh, legal address, and uh, I I took the test. And uh, well, I came home to take the test. You know, it cost Mike fifteen bucks to take the test. And like I was telling you guys earlier, it cost me like six hundred dollars to take the test because I had to. I had to take leave. I had to fly home from Michigan and, you know, connecting flights from Met, from Marquette, Michigan, down to Detroit to Albany wasn't cheap even back then. So I said, I better get on this job because I spent, you know, a ton oh, of yeah. money to take <laughs> yeah. this test. We call so, that the entertainment tax. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, so we, we it was nice up there. We had a few fires. You know, we used to say one a year to keep you interested. Is how they did it because the Air Force is so fire safety conscious. State, mm, right? There's not a lot yet. Here I am graduating from uh, Chinook Air Force Base from the Fire Academy. There. Wow, look at that guy. Just a youngster. Young That's a young, young buck. buck, man. Holy shit. Nineteen. Wow, Nineteen wow. years old. Nineteen. The old slime green rig. Yeah. <laughs> That's all. Well, in the Air Force, that's all they were back then. They're red now, but back in those days, everything was that lime green, yellow, whatever you want to call it. Everything was that color. It was horrible. <laughs> but you know, we live with it. So, what do you have? How many rigs did you have there, or how many guys in the fire department? So we had six. Our particular base was around sixty guys, and we had uh, two pumpers. One of them was cross manned with a crash truck, or two crash trucks, really. And then there was a, what we called the first out pumper. Uh, that was fully manned. Uh, so we had 
that. We had uh, three good sized crash trucks, including what you, you may have heard of it before called a P15, where two, two guys ride up on the top, one in the front, one in the back. They actually ride on a roof. They got these big turrets. You see, I'm sure you've seen pictures, but we had, we had one of those because we had large frame aircraft. We had B-52s up there and KC-135 refueling aircraft and all kinds of – well, it was, in, it was a nuclear weapons base. We had nuclear weapons up there. So, um, so yeah, it was okay. – things were – they're pretty serious about fire safety up there. <clears throat> yeah. Um, real quick, <laughs> I don't know who this is, but his <laughs> screen name is Vidal Sassoon. says that this man defines the term working chief uh, and long sleeves because we're all thirsty. <laughs> we're all thirsty. Vidal Sassoon. Ooh la la. That would be uh, Lieutenant Chris Heinbeck. <laughs> oh, yeah? Oh, good German fella. Nice. Ah, I know who Vidal is. Uh, so, yeah, Sawyer was good. Uh, I, I was just telling my my uh, oldest son a story he hadn't heard. My very first fire ever as an Air Force fireman was uh, off base. It was a mutual aid call. They, they called for our uh, what we call our runway former, which is basically it looks like a 6,000-gallon gasoline tanker, except it's 5,000 gallons of water with a with a, a gas run a water pump mounted to the, behind that. And uh, I had to ride that thing in a snowstorm for about, I don't know, 10 miles off base to get to this fire. And I had to ride on the back of that Ooh. trailer with the other two guys up front with that thing sliding all over the place in the snow. And uh, the interesting part about that is when we got there and I got off it, there were some some kids standing in a driveway and, and one of the young ladies ended up being my wife down the road. Oh, I really? That night. I, nice. I actually met her a couple of years later and she remembered that. And I'm like, Oh my God, that was you. And uh, <laughs> I said, yeah, that house next door to your parents' house. Yeah. I, I, we, we put That's that fire out. Cool. So you so, got a Michigan girl. She was, she was actually a military brat. Her dad was uh, oh. a career military and that was the last duty station he was at before he retired. So they bought a house there and they stayed there so that she and her sister could finish high school without having to move again. So that day I was, Kind of my my interesting Air Force fire story. I guess it wasn't love at first sight because you didn't even remember. No, not that, that night, but the night I met her at the bar two two Ooh. years later. Then it was oh, I don't know. It started with an L, but I don't know if it was love. It was oh, love. Uh, <laughs> shalom. Uh, <laughs> well, well I'll tell you, Chief, I saw, we, we, we saw that young lady uh, helping you. Your technical. Yeah, uh, she's my technical guest. support person. And, uh, as we always say, you definitely married up. Mm -hmm. Good for I did. You. I did. One of the guys that uh, was on another hang around a firehouse used to say, whenever my wife came to visit, your daughter's here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that ain't a bad thing. No, nah, no. Nah. Yeah, she was young. When we got married, she was 19. I was 23. So Ooh. everybody said it wouldn't last, but uh, she kept 37 trying. 37 years later, right? You said 37? 37 coming years uh, coming up. The 30th God bless you. Congrats. Yeah, thank you. Congrats, man. Yeah. That's a good thing. Good times. I, I might have close to that, but I got three different wives. Does that count? <laughs> I don't know. If that Get them together. <laughs> I mean, you put them all together, it might be, right? I don't know if it, they count like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> so so I didn't have used to tell me that if you're married once, you're not, if you're only married once, you're not a real fireman. You gotta, you gotta have more than one. Yeah, wife no doubt. Uh, no doubt. You see that, yeah. fellas? Yeah. Yeah, see. Right, Matt, listen, let's yeah, get to yeah. some Troy stuff here. We're uh, we gotta get oh, moving here. I'm sorry, right. bro. I like to. All right, so. You get appointed April of 86. Yes. And we go to Engine 5. Tell us about Engine 5. First so, of all, this guy gets a grab on his very first tour. Oh, my I mean, God. I can't even believe first, that. Now my, now my first tour, my first my first fire. And uh, so, yeah, Engine 5 was a great company, and it was uh, a great place to be. Uh, I had a great great crew, great teachers. Uh, it, was at the head, it was at headquarters, so it was Engine 5. What we call the rescue squad, which is our version of a heavy rescue. It's, I think it's more like your squad companies than a heavy rescue because it was a, a rescue pumper. And, uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a, real quick about the guys. The battalion chief at that point was a guy named Dickie Walsh. We mm -hmm. called him Walshy. Uh, and he looked just like Norman Rockwell, right down to the pipe. Always smoked <laughs> down the pipe. But he treated every one of us like we were either, depending on your age, you are either like his son or his grandson. And I was kind of, you know, he treated me like I was his grandson. He was the nicest guy in the world. Cried like a baby when he died in 97, he passed away. Wow. Um, but it was, so he was a chief. And then the, the rescue squad was, uh, the captain was Duke Keola. And uh, Larry McConnell was a driver and then, uh, or the chauffeur. And then we had uh, Ricky Marino, Charlie Wilson, and Frank Ryan on the back. And that kid, Beansy, that's Frank Ryan's son, Matt who's uh, was uh, the chauffeur truck two on my platoon before I retired 
out of headquarters where the new headquarters is where we Wait, were. So, so the engine five was the, was the rescue that you went to? Was no, no, rescue? the rescue squad was a, was its own company. It's called oh, okay. the rescue squad. Engine five was the engine company did, in the same house. Did you did you work across the floor at all? Did they allow I you? I did. I did. So that first summer, um, <clears> we start. They started a new program that first summer. We were assigned to headquarters initially, not really a rig, and we jumped every day. There was two of us on the first platoon. And we swapped, we rotated positions every day. And it was a medic rig there too, the old Johnny Gage type trucks. We had a couple of paramedics and, and uh, every once in a while we would ride that also for EMS experience. But uh, so I rode the squad a bit during the summer and I, and I rode engine five a lot. And then um, when the, when the, when that summer was over and we got to go to permanent positions, there was an opening on engine five on that platoon. And I, I just, I grabbed it. I love those guys. They taught me a lot, especially uh, Ricky, Charlie, Frank, uh, Gary Hanna, the driver of engine five, he was our chauffeur. And then Wayne Laranjo was the uh, Lieutenant. They were all great guys. And, uh, you know, there was no sitting around there with your thumb up your ass. They made you learn stuff. Wayne used to make me Lieutenant Laranjo. He used to make me go around a rig. He would go around a rig with me in the morning. Wouldn't let me open a compartment. I'd, I'd have to tell him exactly tell him every, what was in every it. piece yeah, yeah, of equipment right. that was in it. And right. if I got it wrong, he would say, well, start studying again, come back and see me when you, when you can name them all. So they're, nice. they're tough. they were tough guys. They weren't, you know, they weren't huggers. They were, right. they, were they were tough. And you wanted and, to make them proud, right? Guaranteed. Yeah. And, and, and in those days, you know, those days, it wasn't that long ago, but in those days, you know, you could do that. These days it's a little tougher to, you know, to be the, to be the hammer than it was back then. Everybody, every officer was a hammer back then. They, uh, right. They let you know up front, this is how it is. And if you don't like it, then there's 600 you guys. Have, you have to tell budget. these guys to, in their safe space. You have to tell them it's okay. <laughs> You know what I mean? So, uh, so Chief, tell us uh, what was the what was the job? How did you make the grab? What was so the it was. Uh, I started I started shift work. I started on the platoon in uh, the end of June. So I think it was late July. So I was probably like, we have we have a four platoon system, one on three off. So it was probably my fifth, sixth, seventh tour. I don't know. And it was a Saturday night, and uh, <clears throat> we got a box in the middle of the night up the hill towards RPI on a on the corner of a, a Prospect Avenue and Bank Street. And uh, the squad got committed on the other side where the main fire building was, which was actually a two-story uh, garage, oversized garage. And we were second due. And when we pulled up, initially our job is water supply, but the first due engine, engine two, had reported that they had their own water supply. And as we pulled up, a guy came running up and he pointed to the house next to the garage and he said, there's a deaf woman upstairs there. And, uh, you know, she, she can't hear anything. So she doesn't know what's going on. You got to go get her. So uh, we, uh, the battalion chief came around the corner. He heard the guy saying that, and he looked at us with the pipe in his mouth and everything. He said, "Don't get her." <laughs> so, we, uh, so Frank Ryan, who's normally on a squad, he was riding the acting lieutenant that night. Wayne was off. Gary Hanna was driving. So uh, while Gary was getting his gear on, Frank and I we forced the front door, and uh, we went in. and And on the first floor, it was really, really pretty clear. And on the second floor, where she supposedly was, it was. It was hazy, but it was progressively getting a little bit worse. And Frank, what a great fireman. You know, guys bust his balls now because he's he's in his 70s now and doesn't get around as well as he used to. But he was what a great fireman. And he said, listen, listen, Tommy, you you take this door right here, the first one on the right, and it's locked. He said, I'll go to the back because the smoke condition was worse in the back. He said, I'll, I'll search the back and then I'll come back for you. So I, I, I had to force the door into the bedroom because it was locked. And the reason it was locked is because the deaf woman was in there. And uh, I went over, she's asleep, sound asleep in a bed. And I, you know, I'm forgetting that she was deaf. I shine, shine a flashlight at myself under my chin. So now I look like something out of uh, a Halloween oh movie. Oh my God, she must have been. And I'm screaming, I'm screaming, fireman, fireman. And she's just screaming her ass off. And <laughs> Frank just comes, he comes running back and he goes, well, pick her up, you idiot. And get her out of here. <laughs> so I pick her up. I get to the top of the stairs. I take one step, fell backwards and brr, all the way down with her on my lap, bouncing down the stairs. <laughs> She got up, she got up, and she slapped me. And, uh, <laughs> well, did you goose her? Was that what was happening? <laughs> I didn't mean to, but oh. I did. I don't know. And then, uh, so Frank came down the stairs. He's already laughing at me, and he says, "He says, well, don't give her to the cops. They'll take credit for the grab." And uh, as soon as he said that, two cops grabbed her. They go out on the front porch, front page of the paper. Oh my! These officers uh, rescued deaf woman from fire, and you know that was that was that. But all the guys they knew. They knew that that I I'd, I'd gotten her out, even though I I fucked it up as 
I don't, if I'd have killed her, it was the only way I could have, the worst I could have fucked it up. <laughs> right. And, uh, but uh, they were really good to me. Well, she wanted to write me up for the grab. And Frank said, you know, I'm pretty sure the kid's pretty embarrassed by dropping her down the stairs. So I don't think he wants that. <laughs> so, so they didn't write me up. But yeah, so technically I had a grab. That's, my first cool. job. That's, yeah, cool. that's good, bro. You popped the whatever. door, you searched. Yeah. What's that? You know. I said you did well. You popped yeah. the door. You searched. You popped found the door. Her. I searched the room. There she was, and uh, yeah, you know, we was the fire was getting into the soft. It's pretty good. So in a couple more minutes, she would have been in serious trouble, I guess. Yeah. But you know, God bless Frank. He he got me through it. Like he got me through a lot of shit through the years. Right. Uh, like I said, Frankie was a good fireman. When so. you got down the stairs, did she, did she say, is that a Halligan in your pocket? Or are you just happy to see me? <laughs> he was too busy snacking you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's my that was that. beginning. I knew right then and there I had to be on a rescue squad because yeah. I could have done worse than that. So, <laughs> so did, awesome. did you ever uh, get assigned permanently to the rescue squad or you didn't? Not till I was a captain. I got okay. to start right, we'll as a captain, that. but I was, ah. a, I was what we call a fill-in man right. there for a number of years because I was on Engine 5 for quite a while. Uh, I went to – when I became a paramedic, I went to Medic 2, which was in the same house for a while. And then we had a we had an accident. We had the, we used to have three trucks, and uh, Truck 3, which was up at Station 3 on the east side of the city, uh, unfortunately lost their brakes on a hill and rolled over. Fortunately, the guys weren't seriously injured. Uh, Vinny Leach, who was another real good man of mine, was uh, driving it. I was actually supposed to work for him later that day driving that truck he'd asked me to come in and work for him so he could go to a party or something and uh they just sent him home because they well it wasn't a truck to drive at that point really but uh so he had to go to the hospital and they sent him home but uh after that they they didn't replace that truck we ended up going with two trucks and we've had two trucks ever since uh which you know i didn't like nobody liked but that was right. you know, politics is politics that's that was beyond our control I and uh Hold yeah on, so on. then i rode medic they, they put a paramedic rig up there and i rode that for about 18 months and then i went back to engine five oh, Chief, how many, how many, we didn't touch on it quick, but uh, uh, in the yep. beginning, but just quick, how many companies are there? Like, is Engine 5 like a top oh. engine company? Like, is it? No, uh, we have, we have uh, six firehouses. And at that time, we had six engines, engine one through six, three trucks, truck one, two, and three, the rescue, and one paramedic rig. Once truck three rolled over, then we went to two paramedic rigs and two trucks. And then 18 months later, the city was starting to, show some financial strain. So they took medic three off duty and just ran an engine company out of that house. And, and so I moved back down engine five and now, you know, just to, just to shorten the story up. So my wife doesn't come up here and say, shorten it up. Uh, <laughs> uh, now we run uh, five engines, two trucks, the heavy rescue and, uh, and three paramedic ambulance. And right now we run four paramedic ambulances because we have what we call a detail ambulance now, because it is so busy and right. we are so shorthanded that we, if, if we didn't have a fourth ambulance, what we call the detail ambulance on duty, engine two, which cross mans medic two, they would never be on duty. And we would never, we would never, I'm seeing that engine five still out there. Uh, we, <laughs> That's we like never the engine time five. they said they're still on a run. They're at a job right now. Yeah. So, yeah. So engine five got taken off duty. Um, even though it was the busiest engine in the city, they had closed engine four, which was the next firehouse north of engine of engine five station five. And then um, the neighbors up there, it was a lower income neighborhood. They felt like they were being underrepresented. So after a while, the city agreed to reopen that firehouse, but they didn't, they weren't going to go back to six engines. They were going to stick with five. So they took five off duty and put four back on duty. So that's what, that's where the engine five still out there is, is a lot of the old timers like me, we talk about. Uh, the years like, oh, so engine five is closed. Engine. What's that? Engine five is closed. It's no good. The house is there. It's got different companies in it now, but no engine. Oh, no shit. Wow. So what they did a, was, yeah. a hazmat company too, correct? Yeah, we run the the, re, the rescue squad crew or the guys at headquarters. They cross man the hazardous materials rig for the county, the city and the county. They call it hazmat 50. It's a it's a county. The county kind of owns the rig, owns the equipment, but we, we do it. I was on that team for a number of years. Uh, so out of headquarters now, the new headquarters on 6th Avenue is uh, – the rescue squad, which is back to being a rescue pumper for a while, it was just a straight rescue squad, no pump. Now it's back to being a rescue pumper. We got truck two down there and uh, medic four, which we have because we have paramedic ambulances now and a battalion chief runs out of there now. So now it's six houses, but it's five engines. And, uh, Without a five engine. 
without a five engine. Yes. <laughs> how, how does this, how does the rescue squad roll? How many guys do they have? In, now, have? you know, you guys know you guys are I, you guys are so lucky mm. that, that you're able to keep the Manning on a region. I know I'm sure you guys have your share of problems, but we uh, we are so short staffed. We're only running three guys on the engines, um, including the rescue squad. It's a three man crew now. It used to be five. Now it's three. Um, we only have uh, two guys on the trucks and, and how they, how the city justifies that is um, the medic, the medic company, the, the med medic ambulance companies, they supplement the truck manpower to fire and, and work with them. Um, but we don't have enough people. And two can't two guys on the truck, meaning a driver, driver and, and one officer. Guy? A driver and officer. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody says the same thing. What the, you know, you know what's stupid about firemen? No matter what kind of shit they throw at us, we make it work. We always do. Yeah. We just make it work. That's the problem. That's the problem. We do it all our the time. Our problem is we, you know, if you watch this, our problem is we, you know, we attack it with manpower. You could have 15, 20 guys in a in a 10 by 10 room, you yeah. know, that, that had a couch on fire, right? Right. You guys have the exact opposite. You're, you know, we don't have I mean, it's probably less. it's yeah. probably a pleasure not to have people constantly banging into you, but you know, when you need manpower. You know, the yeah. chief usually has three engines, four engines standing in the street, you know, for God's sakes yeah. at any time, you know. We don't have that. And, and there's there's stories as we go on, I'll tell you, but that that really kind of illustrate how big a problem it is. But again, you're at the it's not the, it's not the chief's fault. It's not the union's fault. It's it's not even really the city's fault. It's just, well, I, I put it somewhat on the city. I think our present mayor, I think he's an all right guy. I think he tries. But, you know, I say all the time, if you're if, if you're a mayor, you're a city council person, a deputy mayor, whatever you are, your first responsibility is to provide for the public safety. And if you're not doing that, then I don't care what else you're doing. You're not doing your job. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've been victims of that for a long, long before this mayor was in office for a long, long time. We just don't have enough people. And uh, and I know the chief's trying. He goes over and talks to them all the time. He's a good guy. He's a good friend of mine, Arabic man. I I respect the hell out of him. You know, he knocks heads with the union, but like we talked about earlier, that's, you know, that's, that's the job. You knock, you, if you're the chief, you butt heads with the union. And, uh, but he's, he's trying uh, in his way to get more manpower for us. And that's you know, crazy. It's is Schenectady the same way, Chief? Is Schenectady is the same way. Albany's the same way. Although Albany does have a minimum of three guys on their trucks, but everybody's short and nobody can find, I know, I don't, I don't know if does New York City, I don't, I don't think you guys are going through this. We don't even have enough people to sign up for our exams to no, what? no not new york they got too many people Forty thousand yeah, people we, sign up yeah tell send some of them our way it used to be you had to be a paramedic to get on the job for the last number of years and that really hurt us because that that really cut the gene pool short uh but the, the chief said we we got to get away from that we got to find some people so this next test coming up I, i'll advertise it now you don't have to be an emt you don't have to be a paramedic we'll train you and all that uh and you're not don't even have to be a city resident so Troy's a just great a, city. It's a great a job. Sign up. <laughs> What's that? Pulse. You need a pulse. That's it. I'll you need a pulse. <laughs> you got to miss that though, so you need more. Uh, well, you know what? The PD, NYPD, <clears throat> is having that problem. They have like an open, you know, uh, thing now. So it's yeah. just uh, oh, an open enrollment. So, guys, if you want to join, you could just go down. Just yeah. a similar yeah. scenario. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. that, yeah. yeah. So we great. found this, uh, you know, since doing this show, because we were kind of uh, – in the New dark. York city centric, you know, so we only know what we see, right. but the rest of the country, like you guys, now you're doing more with less, man. You're doing yeah. way more with less. Yeah. You know, like when, I came out, we had, when I came out, we had 156 guys and, and it was more than that yeah. shortly before I came on. So we had 156 men when I came on was the department size. Now we're 112. When the year I came on, we did less than 6,000 runs for the year. Last year we did somewhere in the area of 14,000. Between twelve and fourteen thousand, depending on who you talk to, it's insane. And you know, seventy percent of it is EMS related. We all understand that, but that is what it is. You know, be good at that part too, guys, because that's seventy percent of the, that's seventy percent of the call volume. We well, that's going to keep your firehouses open, right? It's going to keep your pay high. It's going to, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. showing you doing work, right? Obviously, right. I mean, listen, nobody right. wanted to, to go our, to the last. Our EMS guys are in the street all day, every day. They're out there every day, all yeah, day. Yeah. And they Do don't, you guys they don't have an age through. limit? I'm sorry, Pete. Do you have an age limit? No, they they you know everybody had to kind of do away with that. Right. They, yeah. No. Pete, no. Take the I, number. Guys on a job. Fortune <laughs> forty. Pete's moving to Troy. Pete's moving to Troy. <laughs> My wife yeah. wants to stay in New York. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm not sure. 
I, I've heard of guys getting hired in other cities in, in the Northeast in their fifties. You know, if guys are, are can pass the, if you, the thing is to pass the CPAP, you know, and be able to pass the physical and a background check, but that CPAP where a lot of people get knocked out. That's, that's no joke. That thing is that physical agility test is no joke. You got to be ready Pete's for in that. good shape. Pete, you can do it. Yeah. Well, do they take firefighters who run from fire? Wait a minute. We might. not touching that. <laughs> not touching. I could, I could say yes. That. I could say no. Oh, right, right, right. I was <laughs> being funny, but uh, listen, the chief's really got a lot of pictures. He's got a lot of stories. Let's get off the manpower thing now. Let's move on. Let's go. Whoa. Moving on. Now, wow. Now Louis. Now Louis yelling at us. First is Pete yelling at us. Now Louis. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not us. Here. He has you. like three or four stories. I've been wanting. To, I've been waiting to hear. All right. Well. All right, Pete. Show some pictures. What stories? Uh, well, I mean, do we want to go to the? Like the fires, for example, this is a good one. Let's just do this one because it's uh, it's relevant. Let's just say, stand by, hold on here. All right, pulling it up. What's this? So that uh, <laughs> that was after I made lieutenant. Um, I was a lieutenant on truck one. That's truck one in the picture there, and we didn't do so good there. That's me in a bucket. So that you know, every 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 fire story I got, I, that's why I chose these because they all got a story. So I was working. Uh, I was working at engine one on the third platoon as a lieutenant with uh, that captain I talked about earlier, Harry Dahl, that had me ride the rig right after the deputy chief told him not to. And uh, so it's a Friday night in November of 96. We're in the firehouse. And um, uh, I was on a truck with a guy named Joe McMullen, another great mentor. He used to, whenever anybody came to the firehouse, Joe would introduce, he'd say, this is Tommy. He used to wash the wheels. Now he's my boss. And uh, <laughs> that was a character. But so we're, we're in the firehouse. And I think Joe went out front towards the watch desk for something. And somebody knocked on the door and he answered the door and they said, hey, there's a hell of a brush fire up on the hill. And he looked up on the hill and he was just about to say, that's no brush fire when the box <laughs> came in. And because uh, it was up kind of over the hill from where the firehouse was going east towards the east, east, east uh, edge of the city. They were asking if this was a demonstration burn. Yeah, <laughs> it was a demonstration burn, all right. So we got up there, and um, so Joe, I was, you know, I was really, I was a young lieutenant, so I was taking my cues from Joe because he was an experienced guy. And he was a great fireman, and, and I enjoyed working with Joe. I wish I had a picture of him in there, but I couldn't find one. And uh, so we get the truck set up, and uh, I jumped in a bucket, and he says, just go on up and get set. I'll get you some water. And uh, I got up there and I turned the bucket towards the fire building. You can see it's pretty hot up there. Oof. And uh, I'm, I'm like in there and I'm like boiling and I'm slowly every couple of minutes, I'm just ducking down and moving the bucket a little further away, a little further away. And I'm yelling down through the intercom, where the hell's the water? And turns out they had to relay water from a hydrant quite a ways away. They had to put a couple of rigs in the, in the relay to get water up to me. And while well, you're up the, there roasting. Yeah. By the time <laughs> it got, got, got to me, I was like, you know, way over here, away from it. And, uh, so we, we, it, obviously it was a surround and drown and we were there, we were there all night and I was laughing earlier. It's an independent living center and my mother actually lives there now. So <laughs> <laughs> he said, it already burned uh -huh. once, you're, safe. you're safe. It only burned once already. So that's the plan. Let's burn uh, it down and get mom in there. Let's yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was a hell of a job. And the, the, uh, the chief of operations then was a guy named Craig Leroy and he was a great guy. <sighs> But he had a very distinctive voice. He talked like this. And he's telling a story the next day to somebody. And they, they, they related to me later. He says, I'm looking up there. And I don't know how he does it. But that Tommy Miner is just sitting up there in a bucket. I'm laughing, going, I wasn't sitting there in a bucket. I was ducked down, screaming for help. I'm like, get me, some water, get me out of here. Uh, but it was, it was I love that freaking uh, station wagon. Oh, uh, dude, yeah, that, was the, uh, that was a battalion chief's car. Yeah. Freaking love that. Yeah. Yeah. That they use it for the morgue as well. The dual purpose. That that yeah. whole body. <laughs> hey, Ruff, how, how many buckets were you in as a lieutenant? He's in a bucket uh, as a lieutenant. Never. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, but, I was in the bucket only, a lot. The only road with two guys. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. One guy's giving water. One guy. One guy's pointing. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, wow, that's, that's incredible. I, I didn't get the point until I put a white shirt on. <laughs> I, I can't get over the two guys at a, at a truck yeah. company. That's insane. It's, it sucks, but it's that's the world we live in up here. Yeah. What about this one uh, right here? Oh, boy. Uh, that was after I was a captain. That was uh, the Sweeney Law Firm fire, we call it, down on First Street. And I'm going to tell this story because I don't think my son will ever talk to me again if I don't. I had a small problem with this fire. Uh, so this this picture is is uh, 
eh, probably a half hour, 45 minutes into it. And we're, we're kind of ducking down because we we're going to take a line up through that window. And, and cause the, the, the uh, stairwell had burned away. The fire started the old linseed oil thing started under the, stair, the first floor stairwell to the second floor. So we we're going to try to get in there and knock that fire down. But the lawyer that owned the place uh, apparently had some uh, handgun rounds in his desk and the desk was, you know, furiously burning. They started popping off. So we were kind of ducking down to stay away from that at that point. But uh, so anyway, the fire went to a third alarm. Guys did a great job. So later in the fire, things are calmed down now. And and before the right before the fire came in, we had a really nice uh, spaghetti dinner. Ooh. Had a really good cook, spaghetti, sausage, meatballs, Sunday afternoon meal Uh-oh. in April. Great meal. And uh, a lot of garlic. Oh, and, my uh, God. Yeah, so about an hour and a half into it, I got this little, <clears throat> little in my stomach. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> I need to find a place to go here. And uh, so I started wandering around. I wandered into the Delta exposure or the number four exposure. That was a vacant building. And that bathroom was just full of pigeon shit. And I'm like, that, that's not happening. So I went to the building on the uh, the Bravo or the number two side. Oh, well, you uh, had time to go to, the, to to exposure two then, huh? That's What's usually that? not the case. I said you had time to go to exposure two. That's usually not the case. Oh, yeah. yeah I did. <laughs> I did kind of. kind of did. So I, I got it. We we'd evacuated that building early on. So I went into the first. It's a three. I think it was a three-story building. And I, I uh, went into the first floor, went to that apartment door. That one's locked. Went to the second floor. Went to that apartment door. That one's locked. Went to the third floor. That apartment door is locked. Jeez. I looked down and there's a big cardboard box recycling bin there. <laughs> <laughs> full, of, full of newspaper. I was going to say, this is usually when panic sets in. Uh, yeah, this, I, I'm, <laughs> Everything's I'm, locked. I'm done. I mean, I'm, I'm at the end of my rope. I'm like, this this is, what's that movie there? Bridesmaids? This is happening. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is happening. Yeah, yeah. So I took I've been there, off, man. <laughs> took everything off. Took some newspaper out of the box. You know, you got to have a little something for when oh, you're done. Oh, very nice. And uh, oh I did God. what I had to do. I got myself all cleaned up, got all oh, dressed God. up, closed up the box. <laughs> I carried a box at the bottom of the stairs. <laughs> and there's, there's the, the owner of the building standing right there. He goes, I saw you go in. Is everything okay? And I'm like, uh, I got sick in this box. Where's the dumpster? And he, yeah, that was mighty yeah, nice of you to bring. I would have left it I was up there. Say, I would have left that box up there too. <laughs> I would have carried that down. Oh, geez. So I took it over to the dumpster and I go over to the battalion awesome. chief. It was a guy named uh my regular chief was off that night. So the fill-in chief was a guy named Tommy Adams, who was just the the nicest guy you'll ever meet. Just a nice, nice guy. And I told him what happened. He looks at me, he goes, Well, why don't you just take the battalion chief's car back to the firehouse? I'm like, <laughs> I I never thought of that. I don't know. <laughs> so that's my shit in the box story. Nice. Oh my god! Well, we I, we've all had them. Um, oh my god! Two things real quick. Uh, Theburnbox.com. Everybody, make sure you visit theburnbox.com for your monthly uh, mystery box. Uh, he's saying that you know he's wondering if anyone's wearing any long sleeves out here. Right. Boom! That's one. And then Vidal Sassoon again. What did you used to wipe your drinker. long sleeves? I think Vidal's an alcoholic. <laughs> Oh, poor me wow. Well, yeah, that's a rough one, man. When you, you know, got, when so you're funny. bubbling, when you're bubbling up, oh my god! You know, it's so turning, funny. Boy, I've, I've had a few of those where <laughs> we went into a building, uh, you know, it was on fire, and somewhere I just found <laughs> a, a, an apartment. And the best is like, I've actually had like to answer the radio, like when I was on the bowl, like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> nice. <laughs> the chief's calling me and I'm like, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, hold on with the 10th floor. Let me check on that. Uh, yeah. Roof guy. Yeah. Uh, squat to roof. You got that? Yeah. 10th yeah. floor. All right. All right. Stop. Yeah. Me, man. And, I and oh, wait, squ squat to roof. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Hey, well, listen, so you got to go. You got to go. Sling Blade yeah. in the chat is also saying, have you have you got a lot of guests that referenced bridesmaids? Yeah. <laughs> no. Ballbuster. Listen, it could Ball have been like that's, me, my oh. that's my son. That's my son. I, 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 I told the story where I just I had to let it go, right? My bucket pants, but I had no choice. It was just coming fast. <laughs> Thank God crazy. I never did yeah, that. Man. Thank God I never that did was that. Bad. Thank God. Something something similar. I, I forgot about this. Something similar happened when I was a chief. We, we had a horrible lightning storm and thunderstorm, and there were power lines down all over the place, trees down all over the place. So I got almost every company in the city in the south end of the city babysitting this, babysitting that, waiting on a power company. And I'm just driving around between them, making sure everything's all right. And I got the same churn, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm not, I'm not doing that again. 
So I found my way up to engine three's quarters. And uh, like Lou says, I'm in there and I'm doing my thing in a, in a toilet and people are calling me on a radio. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, a couple of minutes away. I'll be there in a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I used to go lights inside. I used to tell the guys we would come back from a run and we had the lights off. And all of a sudden, you know, like you said, all of a sudden it's like, Creak. I'm like, put the lights on and let's go. Let's, I got to get back to the firehouse. Yeah. There's, I can't, allegedly, I can't, I can't, do, I got to do it. Allegedly. <laughs> Dude, I had <laughs> poor chief McMahon's is shaking. If he's watching this, poor chief McMahon's just shaking his head. Gone. Oh That's yeah, yeah, no doubt. Of a bitch. We, we <laughs> come back from a run one time, and Blaze, our buddy Blaze, he's rapping on the window. I'm driving back. He goes, "Get back to the firehouse. I can't hold it. Get back to the firehouse." So I'm like, "Now, purposely, I'm going as slow as I can, catching every <laughs> single light. I'm catching every single light, bro. All of a sudden, the door flies open, and I see him running across the Long Island Expressway <laughs> like a man." Yeah, that's what when I was on a squad, I uh I'd love to tell a couple of squad stories. When I was on a squad, my my chauffeur, my driver was Bobby Conley. And Conley he that's exactly what he would have done. He would have just looked up, oh you gotta take a shit, do you? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's just, slow up. I'll drive thousand. backwards. Yeah, he's driving miles backwards. An hour. Yeah, yeah. That's what I, I did. Backwards. I made sure I caught every friggin' red light I could get, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Darren DeFries in the chat is saying we had a chief who carried toilet paper in an empty coffee can for these emergencies. Exactly. Ah, well, yeah, sure. So. Where, where was that thing before that happened? Yeah, where was that? Yeah, we could have used yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. And, and Bobby Busta is saying the red phone is ringing. I don't know what that means. Maybe that's something that you know. I don't uh, know. In Troy, uh, in Troy, we have what's called every house uh, is, has uh, what's called a red phone. It's a direct line to the communications. So like if a alarm phone. comes in for an EMS call or a uh, a fire alarm, which is just a one company response, or, you know, with no follow up phone call, something like that. They, they ring in on a red phone and they tell you gotcha. what's going on and they put the call out over the air. So All that, right. that's, that's freaking yeah. funny. Well, maybe we move on from taking a shit on a job. Yeah. You know? oh, I love, dude, there's nothing better than shit stories, bro. I love. Nah, <laughs> I think that's not the Chief's legacy, if you yeah. know what I mean. Listen, so, every do we, story do we, has meaning, bro. Do we want to talk about, like, I guess we should talk about some of the fires. I mean, maybe we – Coops, what do you think we do? A quick uh, pull over and go to Iraq for a second because that's a big part of the Chief's life. Uh, you know? Iraq is – oh, it is when he's – hold on a minute. <laughs> that's when he's a captain. Yep. Yeah. So if you have anything else before we move on from lieutenant – yeah, who did you work with? Yeah, the so, over there? Who did you work with? Yeah, so when I was, I, actually, I would because like there was uh, when I was on truck one, um, uh, Harry Dahl, who I'd mentioned before, was a captain, and uh, there was uh, on the engine with him was uh, Billy Cunningham, who's long retired, uh, Paul Daly, who came on with me, but he's retired now, and uh, or no, excuse me, Paul Daly was on the truck with myself. <laughs> on the engine was uh, Billy Cunningham. Uh, Tommy Casey Sr., who's retired, but his son, Tommy Casey Jr., is a lieutenant on a job now. Another great fireman, very good friend of mine. I know he's listening, so hey, Tommy. And uh, and then on a truck was myself. Oh, and Ron Peak, uh, who was at that time was our one and only black firefighter, was on engine one with us. And then on a truck was myself, Joey McMullen, who I talked about a little bit, and uh, and Paul Daly. So uh, Harry was just a character, and he he loved to mess with the battalion chief's head. Our chief was uh, Eddie Cummings at the time. Eddie's long retired. Actually, I replaced Eddie when Eddie retired is when I got promoted to chief. And, uh, and Eddie was a good guy. And he, he, he just put up with a lot from us because Harry just fucked with him <laughs> all he could. So he would just like one day, uh, one day where there's uh we get a, the engine gets a call. Somebody called, said there's a duck in distress on a pond uh, up the hill from the firehouse in what they call the Miami Beach Estates. There's a pond, a little reservoir in that, in, within that, that housing development. So Harry goes up there, and I know he, he never said, but I know he did it on purpose. He got up there, and the duck's, the duck's way out on, on the ice, and somebody thinks the duck is frozen to the ice. So Harry says, well, you know, if the, the ice doesn't look too safe, uh, why don't you send the truck up here? We're going to put the bucket out over the, over the pond and see if we can get close enough to make sure the duck's okay. So Joe and I are like looking at each other going, did he just say he wants us to go up there? <laughs> we just start laughing. So we start moving towards the truck to go up there and poor chief Cummings on the radio. Do not send truck one up. <laughs> do not send the truck up. I'm on my way. So he goes up there and, uh, you know, 20 minutes goes by or so. And, <clears throat> Cummings, Chief Cummings sits on a radio and he says that the duck's doing what ducks do. Engine one's in service. 
He's quacking and pooping. Oh, shit. But Harry was always messing with him. So Harry came up with this scheme That's once uh, that he wanted to have uh, the chief inspectors when uh, when he came into quarters to do an inspection. Because we don't – I know you guys – I don't know if you guys still do that, but we – we don't. We don't do that. We never did that. So, uh, so when he sees Cummings coming up for the morning for the rounds, coming into the house, Harry goes, "All right, everybody, line up." So we all line up, right. and uh, and uh, Chief comes in, and Harry says, "Ah, uh, Chief, uh, I got the men lined up for inspection here." And uh, you know, Cummings plays along. He goes, "All right, very good, very good, very good." And uh, he starts walking down, and he, he gets to Paul Daly, and Paul was one of those guys that never wore the right shirt, so. Uh, what 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 shirt was that, Pete? Which what shirt was that? Uh, long sleeves. Oh, the long sleeve. Oh. Oh. Sorry. I was like, what, what happened? Is this a trick? So, uh, <laughs> anyway, what Paul did was he made a little dicky. He he cut he cut a shirt from here to here, so all he had was the collar, light blue shirt from here to here, and a couple of buttons, and then he had a Reuben on, you know, a Reuben sweatshirt on over it, and he can. Uh, <laughs> Chief Cummings gets to Paul, and Paul says, look, Chief, I got my shirt on. Chief goes, yep, very good, Paul, very good, very good. Paul goes, ta-da, pulls it. <laughs> Sends poor Chief Cummings through the roof. Then the poor guy looks up, and, and Joe and I allegedly, because we denied it at the time, allegedly, uh, had painted. We were using a spare truck. Our, our truck was out of service, like, long-term for maintenance, and it was a piece of junk, but we, we had nicknamed it the Road Warrior. So Joe had took taken uh, white shoe polish and, and painted on a on a ladder the road warrior with white shoe polish. Poor Chief Cummings looked up and he just looked it up and he said, I don't give a fuck who put that up there, but get that the fuck off of there before he <laughs> <laughs> So we're up there doing that while we're while we're getting ready to clean it. Joe Joe turns around to the chief and he says, Hey Chief, Chief, did you did you see the truck one salute? And uh, Cummings goes, what truck one salute? And I had forgotten that Joe had, like a couple of shifts before that, he'd come up with the truck one salute. He goes, he goes, Tommy, we got to do the truck one salute. I'm like, all right. So I, we both stand together. He goes, truck one salute. We went just like this. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, then Joe, and I didn't notice till Joe said, he goes, chief, we got a truck one motto too. And like Cummings is like, he's had enough of us by then. Poor Eddie. We, he was such a great guy. We abused him. He nice. goes, all right, what's the truck one motto? He goes, you want us to go where? And do what? <laughs> quack quack. <laughs> so yeah, Harry, Harry was a character. He was just uh he used to buy uh he used to buy dinner on Tuesday nights. They, he bought everybody's dinner and he bought it from Testo's pizzeria down 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 the street a few blocks from the firehouse. And uh, he would say, order anything you want on the menu, and, and then he'd look at Joe and I and say, except you two assholes, don't order the most expensive thing. So sure enough, Joe, I wouldn't even get a, I wouldn't even get an option. Joe would pick out the two most expensive things in the menu, write them down, and then Billy Cunningham would call them in and they'd deliver it. And you know, Harry'd be like, "I owe you what? What? Yeah, yeah, you got shrimp yeah, and yeah, lobster like, and uh, Miter and Miter and ordered the most expensive shit in the menu. <laughs> nice, <laughs> just Joe, poor guy, Joe went crazy. He had a uh, Harry had a a whole bunch of they called him Harry Street people, just buddies of his. Harry was a Korean War vet. He was in combat in Korea. And he had a lot of friends that were Korean War vets that came in, hung around a firehouse. Mm. And uh, there was one guy, Ned Haggerty, was the biggest ball buster. He was just a street guy. He was the biggest ball buster on earth. And there was another good guy, another guy, uh, Father Leach. He was an Episcopal uh, a priest that, that would come in. And, and Father, his name was Father Fred. And Father Fred only had one leg. And so he'd come limping in. And he was a big boy. I mean, he was a massive guy. And one day he's coming in and, you know, it's warm out. And he, so he knew, we knew he could hear us. And Joe, Joe says, or Ned Haggerty goes, here comes fat Fred, hide the donuts. And <laughs> he, he'd clean you out. He'd clean you out. He'd clean you out. And whenever he was, out. He'd clean you out. He'd <coughs> and, uh, whenever he came in a firehouse, if Haggerty was there, he'd say, oh, father, you're back from Lollipop Park so early. You know, get rid of the, uh, <laughs> the stale ones. Guys hang out. Uh, it was just it was just a riot being up there with those guys. Uh, I, I can't say enough about how funny it was. Is that, is that a single house or they who were they in? I was truck, engine one and truck one. It was two company house. Yeah, I was up there for uh, about eighteen months as a lieutenant, and uh, I remember Chief McMahon, the fire chief. Now he was a lieutenant on a medic rig back then, and he came up one night and he just walked in with all the laughing and the goings on and guys tearing each other up. And he goes, "Man, he goes, I got to transfer up here. It is just not nearly this much fun down at headquarters. This is yeah, this yeah, is yeah. insane." Nice. 
And, and, and we had a congressman that uh, opened and closed our doors, a U.S. congressman, Mike McNulty. He came in and played cards with Harry. They all played cards all day. And uh, his job was open the doors and close the doors if you went out on a run. And uh, oh, shit. he got pissed off if somebody else tried to do it. That was his job. You know? Oh, shit. Nobody from the news media. We couldn't tell the news media. That was the only rule. Don't ever let the news media know that Mike's hanging around here. Great guy. But uh, he didn't want the, you know, he didn't want the news media up there trying to ask him questions about something going on in Congress down in Washington when he was home. So he just hung around up there and hung out and had a good time, played cards, and just part of Harry Street people. It was great. It's just a great house to be in. I loved it. Loved every minute of it. So anyway, that's my engine one story. <laughs> is that is that where you got promoted at it? So you, you got no, promoted? I actually went. I went from engine uh, truck one to truck two. Um, oh right. I went down there because it was an opportunity to go back, basically back home to the first platoon to work with a lot of the guys that I'd worked with my first eight years on a job. And uh, I ended up on, cause then by then the new headquarters had opened and truck two moved from uh, the hill up at engine two down to the new headquarters. And I got to work with, uh, with Jackie Mulligan, uh, who was a great, great truck guy. And, uh, and I got to work with uh, a lot of guys and you know, my son's, my son's in the room going, moving along dad. And uh, <laughs> don't listen to him. He don't know what the hell he's doing. Yeah, he says, fuck you, just, <laughs> uh, so, so I got to work with Jackie for a couple of years before I made captain. We just, you know, there wasn't, I guess there wasn't any particular stories with Jackie other than we got to go to a lot of fires and he taught me an awful lot. And we recently lost Jackie and I was kind of a low a blow for all of us, but uh great guy, great guy, great fireman. And uh, everybody loved Jackie. Everybody had a, 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 a Jackie story always ended up with everybody laughing. He's just a great fireman. Perfect gentleman. Couldn't ask for a nicer guy. So yeah, so that was. Then I went back to truck two for a while. And had a lot of fun there. Who were you studying with? Were the guys that were all studying, or did you do that on yeah, your own? Yeah, yeah, a little bit in the beginning. Um, when when I was going for lieutenant, um, there was a bunch of us. That was when I when I was taking a test for lieutenant. There was a bunch of us working up at uh, three on that medic medic rig up there, on engine three and medic three, and and everybody. I think all the guys in the house except for one, uh, were were going to take the lieutenant's test. So we did a little bit of studying together. Most of the time it ended up with somebody's with a textbook on somebody's face, whether it's snoozing in a, on a couch or something. But we we made it we made a half hearted attempt at it. And uh, I was I had a lot of lucky Saturdays. I was by no means any smarter than anybody else. And, you know, even on a lieutenant's test, I didn't I didn't score great. I scored uh, again. We're talking about Troy, not New York. I scored 13th. And that's, you know, for a small apartment, that's not great. You may you may not see lieutenant in the four years that that list is in existence. But to my benefit, two of the guys that were ahead of me actually got promoted off the old list before this one got certified. So that moved me up to 11th. And then we had a lot of retirements. So I, I got lucky enough. I was in the last group to get promoted lieutenant before that list went, uh, went offline. And uh, back then, there was no interviews. If you were next, you were next. And as God is my witness, I think, uh, I think we should have kept it that way. I think the politics in later years, politics had a lot to do with promotions, and, and I never liked it. I got screwed over a couple of times based on it, and uh, a lot of guys did. And I think, you know, if, if you just go one, two, three, if the guy doesn't do a good job, the guy doesn't do a good job. But I, I don't think that was I don't I don't think that ever really happened when we were just going right down the list. And I don't think it would happen. <laughs> just went right down the list. I really don't. But uh, but anyways, yeah. I, other than that, I had some really lucky Saturdays. I did very well on a captain's test, and uh, I took the battalion chief's test a few times, four times actually. And I was lucky enough. Again, I'm no smarter than anybody else. I was lucky enough to come in number one three out of four times on that on that test. Wow! And I finally got. Yeah, let's like I said, I got I got skipped over a few times. Politics is what it is. Ah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so when I finally oh. got it, you know, timing is uh, right. I guess. Back, let's back it up to the chief. Let's get back to Captain. You get promoted in '98. Yep. <clears throat> and then there's the part that Pete's waiting for. You get deployed in 2000. Two, yeah. So, you know, we all know that nine eleven happened, right? And, and again, mm -hmm. I I'm sure you guys knew tons of guys that got killed down there, and I can't even imagine how how you felt. I only I only knew one. I knew Andy Fredericks uh, was the only guy I knew from Squad eighteen. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, he was the only guy I knew. And uh, so right after that, you know, we went on telephone alert that night. You know, I wasn't uh, I wasn't allowed to go down and work the pile. Some of our guys did get to go down and work the pile that were part of the USAR team. And I was I was on that team at that time. But I didn't I was on telephone alert from the military and the chief. Uh, the chief just said, listen, I'm not going to let you go. I mean, you know, you could get called by the military any any time. We got called it uh, the night after September. We got called at two o'clock in the morning, September 12th, got sent to the base. 
they kept us there for 24 hours. And, you know, you guys know everything was chaos. And they sent us home and they kept us on telephone alert. But in, for, for months, for months, you couldn't go anywhere without letting them know where you were. And then uh, <clears throat> then we got orders to go to, uh, like I was saying earlier, I don't, I'm not trying to be facetious or anything, but an undisclosed location. And I only say that because the mission that the people in that country think we're doing there is not the mission we're doing there. So it was an undisclosed location. We had some reconnaissance aircraft and stuff there. And I went there first, went there for four months in the summer of 2002. And, um, you know, nothing really of consequence happened there other than you were just glad to be doing your part. You know what I mean? Um, but we did have a the only thing of consequence that happened there fire service wise was they had these 50,000 gallon fuel bladders that were next to the runway that, and they would come, you know, trucks or trains or whatever would come in and refill them to refuel the aircrafts. But it was so hot where we were um, that uh, they held 50,000 gallons of uh, fuel, but you could only put 35,000 gallons in it because of the expansion. They would just burst the bags. Well, we had one burst one day anyway, and we were just standing wow. by out there, you know, just standing by waiting for, for the, them to pump it from the revetment that it was in into another bag and do what they do. And all of a sudden we notice these guys, all these maintenance guys in a ramp, they're just scurrying about and they're moving planes and they're just, it looks like they're losing their minds. And I called on the radio to one of the other crash trucks. It was over in that area where they were. And I go, what, what's going on over there? So he goes, I don't know. He got out of the truck and went and he asked, he came back on. He says, chief or, or Sergeant Miter, they're saying that, uh, that the, it's so hot on the ramp right now, the fumes from this, fuel spill are only four degrees from spontaneously combusting. And then we're going to have 35,000 gallons of fuel burning. Holy like shit. That. I'm like, holy shit. So I said, well, uh, I'll tell you what, then everybody back up. So we just <laughs> <laughs> went in <laughs> doubt, back it up as far away as we could and still see what was going on. Thank God it, it didn't light off. But uh, the maintenance guys told us later that, yeah, it was, you know, another holy four shit. degrees and uh, we were off. We were all screwed. So they, and they had to get those airplanes out of there. So that was really in that, that base, that was really the only thing of consequence. And then uh, this this picture is um, the day after Christmas, 2004. We got sent again, but this time we got sent to uh, Balad Air Base in Iraq. And uh, that was, uh, as Pete, Pete was alluding to earlier, that was a whole different ball game. It was at the height of the war in Iraq. Um, the base we were going to, Balad Air Base, which is completely encompassed by uh, a big army base called uh, LSA Anaconda, Logistic, Logistical Support Area Anaconda, um, it was they they called it. I read a newspaper article from the Washington Post. That's Chief Clark, our Oops, fire. Right. Yep. Great guy from Tucson, Arizona. I hope he's watching. What a great guy. Best one of the best fire chiefs, uh, military wise, I absolutely ever worked with. What a fantastic guy that was. Um, but uh, so we had to go to Balad. And um, when we, we were flying in there, we flew commercial to uh, Qatar, the, the country of Qatar, to Al Udid Air Base. And then they put us on a C-130, which is where that other picture comes from. And they flew us to Balad. But at the time, Balad was known as Mortaritaville. The boat, the base got mortared like every day. Right. Uh, right. Every day. <laughs> Mortaritaville. And uh, so what they would do is they would, the, the aircraft would come in, you know, at a really high altitude over the base and it would, it would corkscrew down. So we're in the, in the plane and you're just like this the whole time. It's just corkscrewing around. It's a C-130 just cork till it's going to land. And then we get to a certain level and the, the load master says, all right, you guys, the, uh, you guys ought to put your Kevlar on. So we all, we all grab our Kevlar bags. We're like in the aisles in front of us. We put all our, all our uh, Kevlar shit on. And he looks at me, he goes, you're the NCOIC, right? I go, yeah. He goes, listen, these not for nothing. These assholes aren't shooting at you from the clouds. I'd sit in that shit if I was you. I'm like, that's a high quality idea. So <laughs> <laughs> sat down on it and then, uh, and then we landed, and uh, we didn't know it at the time, but we were landed. The base was in what they call Alarm Red. They were under – they had just had a mortar attack. And um, so they said, uh, yeah, get off our – They you, just this language, get off my fucking plane. We're out of here. We're not staying here. So they, they tossed us off the plane, complete darkness. Somebody finally came out and found us and led us where we needed to go. And that's that was our arrival a lot. We're all like, what the hell did we get ourselves into? This is crazy. But if you could go back, Pete, to that picture um, yep. with all the guys in the back of the plane, uh, I just wanted to name them if I could. Uh, starting on the left is uh, in the back is uh, Russ Coonrod. He's a fireman in Cohoes. And then the guy slightly in front of him is Chris Mengi. Uh, he runs uh, Calderwood Training Solutions, where I work part time as a teacher. And he's also a captain at the Albany Airport Fire Department. Then myself, uh, the guy closest to the front is. Uh, guy named Eddie Cool. I think he just retired from the uh, Albany County Sheriff's uh, Department as a corrections officer. And just behind him is Bobby Smith. 
And uh, I'll talk about Bobby in a minute. He was a, a nurse at uh, an RN at uh, St. Peter's Hospital in Albany. And behind him is Dave Paul, who's one of my closest friends. He actually uh, retired as the assistant chief, the number two in command of the Troy Fire Department just a year ago. And then uh, to the right, the guy with the hat on is Brian Kissinger. He's a Saratoga fireman. And uh, behind him, the guy kind of standing over the top, that's Frank Shoemaker. He's a rescue squad captain on Troy, and he was the captain on a squad on the platoon I worked on as a battalion chief, another really good friend of mine, good fireman. Uh, all these guys that are firemen were good firemen. Uh, but we had a ball there. We got uh, mortared all the time. Uh, but, you know, we made out all right. We lucked out. There were people that got injured and killed by, by mortar attacks. We just we just lucked out. We never did. We got really lucky wow. there. Uh, yeah, good guys, great guys. And then um, – What's that other picture, Petey, with the three guys there? Yeah, so uh, that's obviously myself on the left, and then Bobby Smith in the middle, and then Dave Paul, Assistant Chief Paul. He was uh, he only, we always joke around together. He was I was his boss in Iraq. He was my boss eventually in Troy, and uh, Bobby uh, Bobby became an officer and moved to aeromedical evacuation out on the uh, Air National Guard base here up here at Stratton Air National Guard base. Pete, I know you're a weapons guy. That's a predator in the picture behind us. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Back. Yeah, that's an unmanned, uh, unmanned drone. Back then, it was pretty classified. If they'd have caught that picture, they wouldn't have developed it for us, but uh, they didn't. So, um, <laughs> Bobby, I just yeah. wanted to say, Bob, Bobby passed away from uh, cancer a few a couple of years ago. And if you ever, you know, you hear guys talk about the burn pits and any AFFF foam and the, mm. the PFOAs and all, and all that shit. That's what killed Bobby. He was exposed oh, when we were in Iraq. He was he was uh, exposed to the burn pits a lot there, and then as an aeromedical evacuation flight nurse, he was exposed he was exposed to the burn pits in Afghanistan. After that, a couple deployments after that, and unfortunately, he got cancer and he passed away a couple of years ago. But what a great guy! Funny, funny, funny guy. Uh, we loved him, and uh, you know we're real sad. Obviously, we're real sad to see him go. Um, but if you notice in that picture, if you Zoom in there, Pete, on those weapons. I know you're a big weapons guy. Yep, yep. Uh, what, what's missing there in those weapons? Uh, magazines. Magazines. Yep. So during the, I, the, we had to wear our Kevlar at certain times based on the terrorist threat. And it was the first free elections in Iraq when we were there. So the terrorist threat was like through the roof. So we all had to have weapons on us at all time. We all had to wear our Kevlar all the time. And um, this picture got sent home. And our assistant chief at the time, who was just a great guy, great friend of mine, what a fantastic fireman, uh, Jimmy Hughes. I had to call back to talk to my five battalion chief, Matty McGill, but he, I, I turned out I called on the wrong day. And Jimmy, who was a battalion chief at that time, was working. And he said, hey, I saw that picture you guys sent back. And I said, oh, yeah. He says, yeah, I noticed uh, I noticed you guys don't have any uh, any 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 rounds in your weapon. And I said, yeah, no, if you're uh, – if you're on a base and you're not you're not on a security detail, you don't you don't have you don't have a magazine in your in your weapon. You're just you just carry it in your Kevlar. And Jimmy was a, a CB for 30 something years uh, in the in the Navy Naval Reserves. And he knew there was Navy guys, especially CBs over there in uh, mm. Iraq as well. If I was over there, my guys, they'd be they'd be locked and loaded. Locked and, loaded. Yeah. and I said, well, Jim, there's 30,000 people on this base, like 22,000 Army personnel. 6,000 Marines and the rest are Air Force, and a lot of them are security forces. And if we get to the point where Air Force firemen got to put magazines <laughs> <laughs> in the bottom, we are yeah, truly yeah. fucked if we got to <laughs> like, Oh, man. That's like in Saving Private Ryan when the guy with the, uh, the Nupam or whatever his name was, the guy with the typewriter, the, the typewriter guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. We'd, we'd have been better off carrying a typewriter in those yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. So cool, though. I mean, uh, that you were there and it's just in this crazy time too, that, that surge, that insanity yeah. in those two years. It's just, uh, we, unbelievable. Um, we did lose one of our guys there, not a guy from our New York unit, but we lost an active duty guy from uh Dias air force base in Texas. His name was Ray Rangel. And uh, they were on what they call the Rams team. So if you, if, if you were, uh, I don't know, any, an army guy and you're out in a, a Humvee or, or whatever, and you guys are on some kind of patrol, and you get you run over an IED, or you get in an accident of some sort. These guys, this Rams team, which was which was specially trained firefighters, would go out on a Black Hawk helicopter that the Army would provide, and they would actually do an auto extrication. They we brought Homatro uh, extrication equipment on a Stokes basket, and those guys would hop on a uh, helicopter and go out and uh, cut you out of your vehicle. Well, there was uh, one night there, some Army guys were on a patrol, and they had a Humvee in the front and a Humvee in the back. 
and it had to go down this uh, muddy road. It was the rainy season. There's actually a rainy season in Iraq, January, February. It gets, it's pretty miserable, mucky, and uh, just damp and cold, you know, even just in the 40 degrees. It was just so damp. It was just miserable. So they're going down a road, and they got to take a sharp right, and all the vehicles except for the last one made the turn. They slid into the embankment of a, of a Saddam Hussein-made canal and flipped upside down into the canal, and the water was coming up because it was a rainy season. It had been raining hard. So, you know, it took a little while, I guess, for the patrol to realize that they were missing their Holy last vehicle, you know, maybe a half a mile or so. So they immediately went back. They found it upside down in a canal, and they all went in the canal trying to get the guys out. Un unfortunately, everybody in that Humvee got killed that night. Jeez. Um, all the Rams team out, but they didn't. They didn't tell them. They didn't. They didn't know. It was. I'm sure it was chaos out there. I'm certainly not blaming anyone. Um, they didn't know that it was upside down in the canal. They just knew that there'd been an accident. So the guys went out in the Rams team, and um, by the time they got there, the only thing showing they said as the water came up was just the tops of the tires upside down in the canal. Ah, oh, fuck. They'd gotten some of the guys out. The army guys, their their brothers had gotten some of them out, and they were they had had them tied to ratchet straps trying to bring them to shore, and uh, one of the one of the one of the, the bodies busted loose from the ratchet strap, started going downstream. And Ray, who had all of his Kevlar on, was jumped in, kind of slid down the embankment to try to grab him. And at the last second, he fell into the canal and he was wearing a rock. And we never saw him again. And uh, oh. they found him the next day downstream. And oh my gosh. Just, you know, yeah, it was a tough time. He was a great guy. Oh. He'd only been in our base. We were there at that time. We were probably there a month and a half. Ray had only been there like a few days. He got transferred from one oh. base to this one, and he went out on that mission, and he never came back. And uh, you know, we we remember him. It happened on uh, Valentine's Day. We remember him every Valentine's Day. There's a lot of stuff on social media and and all that. But uh, I wanted to mention that he was such a great guy. His boss became a very very good friend of mine. The guy who was ahead of the Rams team. We called him our special operations chief. His name's Tom Shipper, and uh, he was an active duty fireman for twenty. 20 years, 22 years, but he's, he's a assistant chief in a, a air force base out in California now, out in Palmdale. And uh, him and I talk all the time and he's always talking about Ray. I, I think Tom took that. Tom's a great guy. He took that pretty hard. It was his guy, you know? So yeah. it was, it was a tough time for a few, for a couple well, of weeks. Especially there. like that. Yeah. Chief, right. I mean, you know, if you're in a firefight or you're doing something and you know, listen, I'm not yeah. saying getting killed, but you yeah. lose a guy, you lose a guy, but to lose guys just because they slip off the road, Right. And then another guy goes in, you know, just to make sure that we take home all our guys and then he gets killed for, for doing that. It just is. It's enough to make you throw it. Just, yeah, it think, was, you know what I mean? It was a tough time. We had a nice ceremony for him. And um, yeah, you know, we sent him home and uh, I've hard. never had the opportunity to meet his family. But, uh, you know, I see their posts you know, around, oh. around the time that he died. So. Yeah. Tough, tough time. But you know, we moved on. We had you had no right. You have no choice. Yeah, you have no choice. You're right. right. So, all right. So, like you said before, we you come home and four and, tries, and you're a battalion chief. Well, I, was, I still had quite a few years to do. That was 05. I didn't get promoted for another ten years, so I had a lot of time on the squad. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, and that's where some of those other pictures are, like the the one with the dog and stuff like that. Those are from my years on a squad. Uh, uh, you were a cat. You were a captain on the squad. Then you came back and you went yeah, for the captain. I came back. The that's when I got the squad permanently. I, I, well, I actually got the squad spot in 2000 before any of this happened. Mm -hmm. um, but I got deployed twice while I was a squad captain. Yeah. And uh, all right, yeah. P, let's pull up some of those pictures. Some interesting pictures of fires when he was the captain of the squad. Well, I don't have them labeled. Yeah, in you that actually way. did show pretty much what I had while I was a captain already. The Sweeney Law Firm stuff like that. <clears throat> uh, yeah. So we should move we should move forward too because it's really getting long. We're at nine thirty five now, Kev. So Good time. Uh, where we? I yeah, but you know, there's other right. fires and there's like a stack of other things here. So all right. So then let's uh, if we did all the pictures as captain, let's jump to the chief pictures. Uh, yeah. So his first fire is BC on Howard Street. How about that? You got that one, fella. <laughs> so that was a Sunday morning, and uh, you know. It, it was my first. I was I was nervous. Why wouldn't I be right? My first uh, sure. first fire. Oh yeah. I'd only been for a short time, a couple of months. Um, you know, we 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 had a little bit of a dry spell at, right after I made chief. We didn't have anything till I think it was October, and uh, yeah, that was uh, myself and uh, Jerry Vote, excellent captain. He was my squad captain there at the time when I was a battalion chief. Well, what my squad captain? He was the squad captain, and uh, 
he was a great, great farmer. He just recently retired himself. It was a lot of fun. He will bust your balls until the end of time if you give him half an opening. And uh, funny, funny guy. But uh, so that was that was on Howard Street in the South End. And uh, it was funny because the first the first uh, do engine, the captain um, was on overtime captain. And uh, we have a, a thing in Troy where a working fire is called a signal 30. And then it just goes to a second alarm, third alarm from there. Signal 20 is a minor fire. And then you say how many companies you're holding a single 10 is a false alarm. So it's a pretty simple system. And But the guy never called a signal 30. He just said, you know, engine three in the area, a lot of smoke, a lot of smoke. There's fire somewhere. And that's all he said. <laughs> and, <laughs> please give me more than that to work with. Please. And because uh, I wasn't anywhere near the near the address when he came in. So by the time I got there, both the first and the second two engine were there. And I think the squad was already pulling up at the same time, too. <clears throat> And uh, it was just a small little uh, two-family house, fire on the second floor. And uh, the guys did a bang-up job. And, uh, you know, they made me look good. Listen, every every fire I show you as a battalion chief, they made me look good. That's all I can say. The, the boys always always made me look good. They worked hard. They're aggressive. They follow their SOPs. They do what they're supposed to do, and, and then things get done. But, yeah, that was the first one on Howard Street. And uh, I got in a little bit of trouble there. From with a chief, I get in trouble with chiefs a lot. Uh, <laughs> the assistant chief was at Jim. Oh, I like this guy talking about, and uh, we you never you never finger poked a chief or anything. Yeah, did no, you? <laughs> okay, no. all right. Well, I, wanted I never to. did either. And then you didn't have that chief on your podcast <laughs> the many years later, buddy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. And you never got lifted, did you? Interesting. <laughs> I don't know what all lifted right. means, but it don't sound good. No. <laughs> all right. Just, What's that just other back. picture there? That one, that other job. He's looking up at the fire. I like oh, that look! One. This is this is the Fourth Avenue job. Yeah, Let's talk that about. That was a this. couple of years later. I'd, I'd had I'd had, <clears throat> lucky enough or unlucky enough, depending on your point of view, I have a, a few fires under my belt by then. That looks good. So yeah. Th this was bad. This was uh, this was a Sunday morning also, and I was out on rounds, and um, a box came in for this address uh, on fourth Avenue, but, but they actually, they, they screwed up and they, they, uh, the, the caller called it fifth Avenue. So we went a block away we were at the right cross street, but we were a block up on Give it a little Avenue, time so. to burn a little bit more. Yeah, a little bit, but they, there was a report of three young kids trapped ah. in the building. So um, when they got, when engine one, which was first due, they got to the, the cross street of fifth Avenue, the captain jumped off and he's looking around and he sees people frantically, you know, pointing. And at the same time, the driver, the chauffeur, uh, Kevin Douglas, sees everybody frantically pointing down across street towards Fourth Avenue. And they realize the fire's down at Fourth Avenue. Well, Kevin, Kevin took off with the rig and poor, uh, poor Corey, Corey Christensen, the captain, and uh, uh, Evan Hunzinger, the back step, and they, they had to chase the rig half a block down the street <laughs> at Fourth Avenue where the fire was. And um, fortunately, thank God, um, the kids had got somebody got the kids out before it got nearly as bad as it was when we arrived. So they they ended up being out, but it was a heavy, heavy fire condition on the first floor in the front. And uh, uh, the guys, uh, the guys went in and made a Yeah, you can see in a, in, that's where it was initially, but it, it went up through the walls all the well, way that's to a the cool attic. Old building, man. Holy yeah, it, it, it took like the whole place of, pretty much. One of those mansard roofs, maybe. Yeah. Like, yeah. What, is that's this the, is this one of those buildings, Lou? Remember when we guys when we did that show and then there was <clears> like a like a flue that goes up the side of the building that balloon carries construction the balloon construction. Yes. Was it? Probably. Yeah. This Probably. was balloon frame construction. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Look at Petey throwing that out. Yeah. Wow. Construction. So I like it, Pete. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, the guys That's had a great job. To my knowledge, it was sir. already in the walls. <laughs> and, uh, my, my kid there, my, my son, Justin, he was a lieutenant then. He, uh, he ended up on a nozzle for a while. Got some nozzle time. Did a nice job. All the guys yeah. did a fantastic job. But the funny part was that early on in the fire, they go in the back to search because that, that attic, that was an apartment too. And uh, the guys on truck two on the second alarm, they went around back to search the uh, second and the third floor. And the lieutenant, Mike DeForge, a uh, good friend of mine, good fireman. They're all good firemen. I'm not going to bash anybody, but these guys are really good firemen. And he went up to the third floor and he comes to that front window in, a, in the cupola there. And he's he's out the window and he's giving me a thumbs up. He says, uh, there might be some fire in the walls, but I think we're looking good up here. Well, at that point, there was fire around the sides of that cupola on both sides coming out from between <laughs> the third and the case. second floor of the attic <laughs> area. I'm like, you're not in a good shape. Get the hell out of there. <laughs> yeah, says, yeah, yeah. And he looks around and goes, oh, shit. So he <laughs> went back to the other end. They got a nozzle. Looking and good. And Meanwhile, it's that's what he said. We're large looking large good. Apart. I was like, look at that. You're not looking good at all, buddy. Uh, but this, uh, this picture got me in a lot of trouble. 
So uh, a lot of the, a lot, you know, and everybody means well, but a lot of the surrounding uh, volunteer departments, um, when this, the photographer, this guy, uh, Jeff Belschwinger, he, he goes by to handle Sidewinder on social media. He takes great pictures at fires and he took all these pictures and uh, he put this on his website or on his social media page or whatever. And uh, he immediately started getting, you know, getting guys commenting, why is the chief carrying hose? That's not his job, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I made the mistake of commenting on that, which I will never do again. I never did after, and I'll never, ever do again, saying, uh, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, there's not enough manpower. So if they need something, they need something, and you're the only guy available to go get it, you go get it. And then they kept talking about poor Sid Sadowski, who was in front of me. And he's not a he's not a chief, but he wasn't carrying hose. But uh, <laughs> but uh, he was he was doing something else. I'm not knocking Sid. So uh, so I got I, I got in trouble with the chief's chief. office for making a comment. They said I should have kept my mouth shut and stayed off Facebook, and they weren't wrong. I should have just let it go, but I didn't. Cancer. Yeah, yeah, but you know what? It's uh, look, you're a guy who leads from the front. And everyone in the chat, like v, the, v, our buddy Vidal here is calling you a working chief, but it's true. You know, so what? You grab the hose and I get it. It's optics for a lot of these folks. Yeah, man. Know, and it's political. You know I'll what I mean? Take, I'll take if you, you leave a nozzle and I can get my hands on it once I get in there, I'm taking it. I, you know, oh, there you go. Chief I will. grabbing a nozzle. Oh, <laughs> I will. Nice. You know, that's, listen, I'm nobody special. Those, Like I said, these guys, they made me look good every day. They truly did. They're just great guys. So, so that was at far Fourth Avenue. That was quite a far. They if did a I great saw job. A chief carried a, a hose over his shoulder. I'd be like, "Look at this guy. Good for him, man." Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's. it's I mean, I, it's, I, it's, I had a hard 20, time. There's twenty guys standing around doing nothing, and the chief's doing that. Then that's the problem. Right. Yeah, every guys were good. If I, if right. I started to do something, and right. there was somebody with free hands, and they saw right. me doing it, they would, they would come up and say, "Chief, I got that." You know, but if which if, was if, great. If everybody's working and you're just lending a hand because you're standing yeah. there, that's a different story. Yeah, that, everybody, that was, you know, everybody was working. a lot of respect part. doing that. That's for sure. Everybody was working there. He's a working man's chief. That's what I like. That's yeah, the they, they, had, they, they gave me a sticker. You can't really see it there, but there's a little sticker on the back of my helmet that says working boss. Oh, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think I had it on that fire yet. There's There's got to be a fire with it on there. All but, right. All I right. Know, I know, but they... I think it was Vidal Sassoon who gave me the sticker, to be honest. <laughs> oh. After he cut your hair? Yeah. He's, his, hair, his hair is perfect, man. He makes my hair look horrible. Oh. His, his hair is perfect. <laughs> I got you. Chris Heimbach. I can't All believe right. you guys don't know him. He sells All right. So fire apparatus. we have to do the notorious Alpha Lanes fire. We got to right. talk about this one. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, you're right, Pete. We had this on Cocktails and Cocklos. We yeah. did. So I remember. I love when, that freaking Bowling pin right there, man. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. That was, that was, that was up on the roof initially. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh so we had this on Cockwolfs and Cocktails, maybe three or four episodes back, where there's a, a woman standing outside of this thing screaming her head off. Yeah. Uh what happened here, man? So that was when the uh <laughs> when the combination backdraft flash over, whatever you yes. want to call it happened. Yep. So what what happened is just a little bit of a backstory. I know I know everybody wants me to compress things, and I get that. Um, there was a sprinkler alarm at a grocery store in the other end of the city, the far South end of the city. So myself, uh, the rescue squad, the first new engine or, 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 or an engine company and, uh, and a lot, one of the latter companies were on the sprinkler alarm. And when that box came in, the assistant chief, my friend, Dave Paul, he took that box in because we were at the other end of the city. And when engine one that was first due arrived, the captain, Corey Christensen, same guy, there was a report that on this, there was a, there was a small area that was a second floor there. You can see in a picture of fire coming out. There was an office up there and a guy had a, a small bed there. And sometimes he would stay the night after a long night working a bowling alley and rather than try to drive home. So there was concern that he was still in there. So Corey and uh, Sean Luby, who was uh, working an overtime shift, um, they, they took a line and they went in to squad with the squad wasn't there. That was the squad's job would be to search, but they weren't there. So they went in and, with a line to try to protect the stairwell, maybe take a shot up the stairs and make sure nobody was there. Well, they got in there and they didn't get in there too far and uh, everything went to shit and everything lit up. And uh, Sean was able to dive right back out the door, but Corey got a little bit uh, disoriented 
And uh, he was he realized he was in the bar area and, and these front windows there that are full of fire. That's the bar area. And he figured if I could just they weren't full of fire yet, obviously. Uh, he figured if I just get to those windows, I can get out. And at the last second, the driver, Evan Hunziger, a really good kid, good friend of mine, Ev didn't know what else to do. So he charged the hose line. They hadn't charged it yet. And Corey ended up accidentally finding the hose line as it was charged, kind of more or less tripping over it, crawling around, trying to find a window. And once he found that, he was able to find his way out. And he just got out before the whole place lit off. He just barely got his ass out of there. And uh, I was – when all that was going on, when they, they called a mayday, when all that was going on, I was flying up Fifth Avenue through the city trying to get there. We cleared the sprinkler alarm, and we had a parade of rigs because they'd already put a second alarm in. We had a parade of rigs going from one end of the city to the other to try to get there to help them out. And we all thought they were in, in bad because we didn't, all we heard was a mayday. And then for the longest time or what seemed like the longest time, we didn't hear, you know, driving up there. We didn't hear anything else. We didn't know what the hell happened. But when we got there, you know, I got told, no, they got out. They're good. And then, uh, and it was just, you know, just a huge freaking fire. I ended up getting assigned to the rear of the building. So I was in the rear most of the time with the uh, truck company from a mutual aid department from water fleet and, and uh, uh, some guys from uh, engine six and engine two. And, um, you know, it was an all day affair, but it was, a, it was a, one of the biggest fires I've ever seen, uh, in my, oh, you know, all that lane oil and all that shit. Oh, you know, oh yeah. Right. And it, you know, they're going to collapse. They're all trust construction. Cause they got, they gotta be. So, you know, they're going to come down and, uh, yeah, it was a long, it was a long day, very long day. <laughs> Glad I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> Screw that shit. Yeah. So. Holy shit. That's funny. Yeah, you know, I was Let's, just glad Corey. Uh, I was just glad, glad Corey and Sean were okay. That was yeah, hell yeah. That was really scary I, I shit. Was just you're gonna ask you about uh, your sons. Now you both your sons are on the job. So yeah, so Justin got on in uh, 2013, and um, you know it's 2022. So nine years later, he's already a captain. He uh, he's worked his way wow. up through the ranks, and uh, you know I'm his dad, so of course I'm 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 you know biased, but I think he's got a pretty good reputation as a fireman, and uh, he does his job. He's really good. And then Jeremy got on uh, in 2014, but he stayed a few years in Troy. Then he, and I, we talked earlier, he's a special operations airman also in the air national guard, but his base is his base of operations is out in Syracuse. And, uh, he was constantly getting shipped out to Syracuse and taking military leave. And then he got deployed for seven months to Syria. And, uh, when he got back, they kept him on active duty to do training, you know, to train other guys and some of the things that they, they had to do in Syria and then um, they weren't letting him off active duty. They said they were going to keep him out there for another year, you know. And I think some guys in Troy were getting antsy to get him back, and because the guys had taken care of him, you know, they covered his shifts with their vacation time, so he, he stayed whole. No shit. Yeah, they they really took care of him. The guys took care of him, and then, um, you know, an opportunity that he couldn't refuse. Uh, well, he could have refused it, but it, it wouldn't have gone well for him, you know, really either way. Um, he had an opportunity. They approached the Syracuse approached him. Uh, somebody from his base knew somebody and they said they had a guy that was a fireman in Troy that was, uh, that was out at the base and he was still on active duty and, and Syracuse was getting pretty desperate for men. So they were looking for laterals. And, uh, so they approached Jeremy and they said, you, you know, you want to come out here? And he talked to his commanders and they said, well, you know, if you're going to come out here, if you're going to be here, we'll let you off duty. You know, whatever days you got to go to work, we'll let you off active duty so you can go to the firehouse. But then when you're as soon as the minute you got a firehouse, you're ours again. So if we need you at the base, you got to come back to the base so he took that opportunity and, uh, you know, never really looked back. He, he enjoys it. He loves being a fireman out there. He's looking forward, you know, he's just graduated from jungle warfare school today down in Brazil, and he's looking forward to getting back, back home and getting back to the firehouse. And, um, I know there was a little bit of consternation from some guys in Troy about him leaving after they donated time to him. And I get that. I truly get that. But, you know, as our union vice president, Danny Riley, when I talked to him about it said, listen, you got to do what's best for your family. And what's best for his family was to be out there. So, because he wasn't seeing his wife and kids, because he was out there and they were here, so they moved out there and he took the job. And uh, oh, he's in Syracuse they, now, full time. Then obviously, yeah. And they listen. They they got it dicked out there. There you have, That's he. That's him this morning. I can't believe he got those pictures, Pete. Pretty good we for got him. Yeah, we got that's him on the right this morning, graduating from Jungle Warfare School. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And just just for the uh, listening audience, if you don't know, he's Attack P. Uh, these guys get attached to very high speed units, uh, tier one, tier one units, meaning you know like 
DevGrew or Delta or even just, you know, Green Berets and SEALs. So uh, <clears throat> these are guys who call in the airstrikes uh, when they got to level stuff and they have to know how to operate. So you're not just talking about, oh, you know, he's got this little job in the Air Force. This is like an elite dude right here. Yeah, so, he, gets, uh, he gets deployed a lot. He does. He gets called up a lot and he tells us some stuff, but I think there's a lot of stuff that he really can't tell us. Which no. Is like, no, it's probably better that way. Yeah, um, but he's doing well. You know, he's he, we're looking forward to coming home. He should be home by Thanksgiving, and nice, uh, nice. We'll, be, hopefully we'll be able to see him. And I, uh, I remember that chief. That guys used to, you know, we used to have guys get deployed. Yeah, and it was for guys that stayed in the firehouse, right? It, I don't know. I mean, obviously the guys were doing the right thing, and they 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 were going to, and uh, providing service, obviously, which is what we need and it's incredible but there was some type of a weird thing in the firehouse yep. with that i i don't, I don't yeah. know how i could put my finger on it anymore than saying it like that you know what yeah. i mean it, it, it is a hard little... i had to keep out of it you know i'm a battalion chief and he's also my son so i i i kind of had to try to stay out of it and stay above it and not getting into too many arguments about it there was a couple of times i might have lost my temper a little bit with this guy or that guy you know trash talking him but you know i get it they covered him. They they donated time and <clears throat> kind of felt like he should have come back. And I understand that. But like I said, at the end of the day, he he did what was best for him, what was best for his family. And, you know, sounds sounds, uh, you know, quirky, but he did what was best for his country because they trained him to do this shit. And he needs to be available to do it. So he did. Yeah. What I did. yeah. And, uh, and then our third son, our youngest son, Jake, he uh, he went a different route. He works for the Baltimore City Fire Department, but he's got a master's degree. He's a data analyst, and he he's their data analyst. He uh, he works very hard with uh, 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 some of the deputy chiefs. I'm not sure exactly who his boss is, but you know, kind of streamlining operations down there, trying to do some work with uh, making EMS program a little bit more palatable because they're just so busy down there, trying to change things around. So and he really likes that. So they're all involved in one way or another in the fire service, which just makes me extraordinarily proud of all three of them. So it's pretty cool. And thank God they cool. look like their mother. Yeah, thank yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, they're, all, they're all good boys. Like I said before, though, you can't be father. They're not that great. You can't be father of the year if you haven't picked them all up at a police station. Oh, oh nice. <laughs> Those sons like it. Nothing serious, but, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, boys, good, good. Boys, good. My goodness. So he did a total of what? What do we say? 37 years, Chief? What was 36, it? 36, five months and 14 days if you're counting. And a couple uh, hours in there somewhere. Yeah. And uh and that was just recent you retired, right? Yeah, my last uh, shift was the 21st, and and we caught a two alarm fire in the middle of the night on my last 24 hour tour. And then uh we I had nothing but fires for the last I worked a whole bunch of overtime shifts the last like eight weeks before I retired. And it was like fires every day. It was crazy, it was just insane. You know, I baby know. Jesus. He yeah, that's uh, that's my youngest boy's nickname. They call him Baby Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Everybody in the firehouse calls him Baby Jesus coming home for Thanksgiving. You know? nice. <laughs> so he goes in making grabs at his first fire, and he leaves on a bang uh, yeah, with, another, with a job. Hard. Yeah, dude, he's yeah, done all right. He's done. A, he's done a good job. I have to yeah, say, I loved yeah. it, man. I loved everybody. I miss it. I miss it horribly. I was going to yeah, say, I, have you adjusted yet? Yeah, kind of, for the most part. You know, we've been busy. We did a lot of traveling the first month or so. Uh -huh. and, uh, we're kind of settled in now. We got a couple little trips coming up down the road, but uh, I'm getting used to it. I'm still teaching for uh, like my buddy Chris Mingy that I was in Iraq with. His company, Calderwood Training Solutions, does a, a lot of teaching. And, uh, you know, he's he's uh, he's actually got myself and my wife helping him develop some leadership courses that he's hoping to throw out there. And uh, I work part time because I'm still an EMT. I work part time at a little ambulance service in a, a little suburb of Albany called East Greenbush, and I mostly work there because I just love the guys I'm working with. They're all they're all firemen. You know, we're just it's just a firehouse kitchen table with no fire trucks, just ambulances, and we just right. bust each other's balls for 24 hours. Nice, you need that. Life. So I think you know, that helps a lot. But you yeah. know, your friend might need who started that company. Maybe he needs to get the word out. Maybe he needs to advertise on a show that directly hits his demographic. I told him how. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm throwing ow, that ow, out. There. Ow, ow, on, ow, you know, ow. on a little on a little show Ooh. that has about two million downloads. Or and I know what. Uh, I know Chris is watching, so Chris, you know, might be time to open up that wallet and do a little advertising. Yeah, with don't do a Petey. Don't do a Petey. Oh no, man! Alligator yeah. arms. Don't take yeah, out no. those. Don't take out those bills that have the president squinting. Ah, oh, the light, the light is killing me. 
They got the communion money. Oh Chief, before uh, before we get to the old school, was there anybody else you wanted to mention or any story you wanted to tell? Well, I'd like to mention uh, Albany firefighter uh, Eddie Veerhoff, who, who unexpectedly died this week, 16 years on a job. He died at home. I think he died in his sleep. Uh, I don't know all the exact circumstances, but he was a beloved guy over in Albany, and I'd, I'd had the opportunity to, to uh, speak with him a number of times when before I was the chief when I was on the union executive board at different uh, functions and stuff. And he was a hell of a nice guy. I, he was on a rescue squad over there, uh, Albany's rescue squad, which is kind of the same setup as Troy's great guy. And uh, I just, you know, want to give my condolences to his family and his, his brothers over in Albany. It was just a, you know, tough thing, tough thing for everybody. And uh, shout outs. Yeah. There was a couple guys. I don't know if they're watching or not, but when I was in the military, uh, Lewis Lynch, my first, uh, first, what they would call the crew chief was like a Lieutenant. He uh, took me under his wing, taught me a lot. A uh, guy who ended up leaving the Air Force base, he was a civilian firefighter on the base, but he went to the city of Marquette Fire, Fire Department, became their chief. Tom Belt was a huge influence on my career. And then, uh, oh boy, so many. You know, of course, my uncle, who's passed away, Walshie, who's passed away. But Matty McGill, my battalion chief, when I was a captain on a squad, he gave me a lot of latitude to, uh, you know, do do things in a squad my way, and I always appreciated that. And uh Ricky Marino, can't say enough about Ricky Marino. Charlie Wilson, I already talked about Frankie Ryan. Uh, Wayne Larangio, my first officer on Engine 5. Like I said, he was as tough as they come, but uh, he taught me a lot. Uh, Duke Keola took me into uh, the cap. He was a captain of the squad when I first came on. He took me into my first fatal fire. I was driving Engine 5 and pumping, so I didn't uh, wasn't actively fighting the fire. And uh, when it was knocked down, he said, come on, kid. You got to see this sooner or later. So he took me in. You know, show me what happened where the girls, there was two girls got burned to death up there. And they, you know, they were still up there. He showed me where they were, how they were, you know, how he says, you got to see the sooner lady may as well see it now. And I always, I always appreciated that, that, uh, you know, he took the time to do come find me on the fire scene and, and do that. That was an incredible thing. And, uh, God, there's so many, I don't want to miss any Joe McMullen, uh, Bobby Conley came on a job with me, almost cost me the job. <laughs> he did. He did. When, they were, when the police department was bringing around your your packets you know they're checking your residency making sure you live where you say you live and i had just moved to the third floor of 334 4th street and i didn't even know bobby but he lived next door and a cop stopped and gave bobby his packet said hey there's this kid miter lives next door to you he goes i don't know anybody named miter that doesn't that lives next door i, mean, I don't know what you're talking about well thank god the cop knocked on the door anyway and i answered because if he didn't, I never would have got out of the job. <laughs> so he never lived there. Friends uh, like that. Who needs that? heard a guy. Uh, Bobby was a great fireman. Uh, Mark Olusky, who I came on with, was just a fantastic fireman. Um, uh, my last squad crew, uh, Ray Littlejohn, uh, Joey Coonan, and my son. Great crew. A lot of fun. A lot of fires. Uh, Hell yeah. Yeah. Okay. My son's well, telling me well, somebody wants squad stories. He just came in the room. Tell me somebody wants squad stories. Yeah, we're, 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 we're hitting the wall. We're hitting the yeah. wall. You know what I want to ask? Sorry, G man, no squad stories. <laughs> tell, tell me, uh, just a quick thing. Uh, so your wife does has her own podcast. Is that right? She what does. Yeah. So she's my wife. Uh, she got very involved in what's called the Clifton Strengths, which is basically learning your natural strengths and talents, and then how to move your career in the direction based on that. So you're happy. So she runs a podcast now called, uh, uh, finding your calling, uh, or yeah, I think it's finding your calling. I can't remember now. She's, hmm. she's going to kill me cause I can't remember now. Uh -oh. but, uh, uh, she'll have to run up here and tell me, run up here and tell me. Um, but she, she teaches people how to use their Clifton strengths to find their passion and work within their calling rather than work a job for their entire adult life that they really don't like and huh. just get by. And uh, you know, if more people did that, I think we'd have a better world. But she's very, very good at it. Just look her up at Sherry Miter Co. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, she's just a wonderful person and I love her to death. So I don't know what to, <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you there. Oh, that's good. Nice. I just wanted to make sure that we got the little plug no, on the podcast. Awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So if she needs other out. guests on who love doing their job, I mean, she got me and Louie. We can come on. You know, and if she needs to, she needs to. You guys are working with work within your calling. It seems to me like you kind of yeah. still are. So. Well, I was going to say, if she needs anyone, you know, that, that she can work on to find their true calling, she should call me then. Oh, yeah. That would be Pete. Yeah. <laughs> she oh, will, yeah. Pete. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You, she's watching downstairs on, on YouTube on TV. Uh, I, need, so. I need the help. She I need will. the help. I'm stuck. Don't call you. He ain't lying. He I'm ain't stuck. lying. No. All right. So, shall we? Do it. All right. Do first, first and foremost, guys, it's almost that time because you know oh. what time it is first? It's time for the First Responder Center for Excellence. That's right. Uh, that's a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting the lives and livelihoods of first responders. Their education and re research initiatives aim to bring greater awareness and understanding to the challenges of the health, safety, and well-being of firefighters, EMS personnel, and other first responders. The goal is to reduce line-of-duty injuries and deaths as well as occupational illnesses. They are an affiliate of the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation. Now, today's Old school health and safety tip of the day is never store bunker gear inside of your car or home. When bunker gear must be transported, use a gear bag or a clear plastic bag. Makes a lot of sense. What was that product, guys, that we had on the show that time? Remember that gear bag? A, a decon bag. It decon was. bag right. we had. Right. So get your, get your, what was it, like 60 bucks, 50 cents? Yeah, but that, that's a little different. I, I mean, it depends. But, uh, that was yeah, from, so. uh, who was that? True North? True, True North. North. That's right. True North. That's it. If you so, want a little bit of a less expensive one, getting salty apparel sells a gear bag. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> oh. Oh. Just wow. Kind of did. I took that cheap oh, plug. Yep. He's yeah. fucking incredible with that. <laughs> yeah. You're telling me. So, you guys call that a well, shameless plug? That well, is listen, a shameless plug. Whatever listen, gear bag you use. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. If Go you ahead. love your family do the right thing and take care of yourself don't bring no contaminated home shit home in your car where you're putting your kids in the car seat you're bringing contaminated bunker here come on don't do it if man you, if you love your family it. take care of business yeah right? and then head on over to the first responder center.org or if you're watching this right now not on your phone take your phone out point the uh, camera at the little squiggly lines on the right hand that's the qrs code and right. it will take you there immediately that was that but real quick before we get into the old school tip of the day i have to shout out vidal sassoon again my god man uh he said vander mullen fire apparatus sutfin fire apparatus t1 t2 t3 pl custom ambulances m1 thanks for everything chief ps long sleeves my wow Thank you, bro. I Chief, you see that. that guy a lot? That beat he's got a, he's got his own, uh, I do. He, he, uh, I've been lucky enough to uh, remain pretty close to my my platoon. I, I've stayed out of the firehouse since I retired. I want uh, my replacement, who's another good friend of mine, Mike Bailey. He just got promoted recently to fill my position, and I want to give him an opportunity to get his feet wet. I don't want him thinking, you know, that I'm stepping on his toes or feeling like, you know, he, I just, I just don't think I should be there right now. When, when he gets settled in, I'll go back for a cup of coffee now and again, but I, I remain pretty close to those guys. I, I talk to them a lot and uh, I hope I get to remain close to them for, you know, years to come. They're all great guys. Well, well when we send, when we send you our little goodie bag with all our stuff, we're going to send Vidal Sassoon uh, something too. So. Oh, cool. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Right. Make sure you take stuff so, Well, you know what time it is though, Kev? Oh, I think it's. Check your watch. Well, if I had a watch on, it would say it's the old school tip of the day time, bro. That's right. right, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for the old school tip of the day. Day. Hey, hey, hey. Take it away, Chief. All right. So uh, I got I got two of them. They're short. Um, the first one is, and I learned this very early on a job uh, from a good friend of mine, George Badgley, who's long retired from Engine 4 took me out to lunch with uh, my friend Vinny Leach and Gary Favor, our old UFA president last week, all three outstanding firefighters. Vinny Leach is just a great guy. George is just a totally great guy. Favreau is just great, great guys. But anyway, uh, George taught me years ago, uh, don't bottle up the stairway. We had a fire on uh, uh, Fifth Avenue uh, in, a, in, a, in the gut, in the ghetto, as Lou says. And um, the funny thing that goes with it is, we were first due. I had the nozzle, except that I 
I kneeled down on the, the front steps to put my mask on and engine four showed up. My driver had already gotten his own water, so they didn't have to supply him. And they ran up, they took my nozzle and they went upstairs, put the fire out. <laughs> I'll kill somebody. And George, to this somebody. day, that was like 1986. George, to this day, bust my balls about that. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, he told me, don't, he told me, don't bottle up the staircase. If they got a bail, you know, we call it the Congo line. Can't have the Congo line on the staircase. So, fellas, if uh, if the guys aren't moving in, if they're still near the door, near the staircase, then keep that staircase clear till they start moving in until you can get up to do what you got to do without without stopping them from having to bail out if they have to. Do not bottle up the staircase. I've seen that happen where guys are trying to get out for one reason or another, and they can't because there's just a guy at the bottom of the stairs and the guy's halfway up. They don't know what's going on up there. Things are going to shit and the guys can't get out. So don't puddle up the stairway. Don't form the Congo line. Uh, I have a second one. And this is this kind of goes to officers, lieutenants, captains, battalion chiefs, whatever, uh, especially young officers. Know your crews. Know your people. Know what makes them tick. Know why they're there. Know who their wives and girlfriends are. Know their kids' names. If they got something going on at home, like a sick wife, sick kid, that's you know keeping them their minds occupied. They're not really in the game. You got to know about that. You got to be there for them. I'm not telling you to coddle your people. I'm not telling you that at all, but you got to know what's going on with them. So take the time to get to know your people, have that open door policy and let them know they can come in and talk to you about anything, fire related, family related, whatever that it, you might not know the answer, but maybe you can point them in the right direction. So know your people. That's it. Nice. Nice. You know that, uh, that that's Lou. That's kind of one of your things, the stairway. Yes. Yep. How, how many guys can you fit in a fire building? At least five more. No. Nah. I've I've had some some situations with the stairs, uh, and you know, like we say, the first guy could feel all the heat. You know, the second guy right behind him, he feels a little bit of heat. The fourth guy, fifth guy, sixth guy back, he doesn't feel shit. So uh, he doesn't know it's getting bad until guys are trying to dive over the top of everybody. So, mm. but and, and I've seen it. I've seen guys trying to, and it's not it's not pretty. Oh, a lot no, of fuck, get the fuck out of the way kind of things going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, and funny I, games till 300-pound fat daddy rolls over <laughs> you trying to get out of a doorway. Right. You know? It dives over you like a swan. And, yeah. and Chief, I will say I had an open door. I, I really enjoyed when guys would come to, to the office and uh, knock on the door and say, Luke, I talked to you for a second. I'm like, yeah, come on in. Close the door. I, I lived for that. I love that yeah. stuff. You know, Me the too. trust. You know, I really did uh, enjoy that. Yeah. And like you said, I always tried to give honest, good advice. And uh, I think it worked out good for me uh, over the years yeah. that way. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, 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 I have the same philosophy. They're human beings. You know, they're not just they're not just machines that just run down hallways or crawl down hallways. They're, they're human beings and they got problems. And if you can help them, help them. You know, it's the yeah, majority of the time. It wasn't fire related, obviously. Right. Yeah. Most of the time it was something personal going on. I think yeah. they didn't know what to do. And, they, you know, they look up to you. You're an officer. So help now. Act so act like it, right? Yeah. If you're gonna lead, lead. Yeah. Love it, man. I love it. I love it love too, it. man. Thanks well, for joining Chief, us thank tonight. You, too. Uh, yeah, thank you. First of all, for your military service, for your for your service in the fire department. You. Um, you know, busting out tree kids who turned out really well, you know, not too many yeah. people can they're say not in jail. jail. So you've done a great job. <laughs> You know, when you're married you. up, that's for sure. Good for you. <laughs> Clearly. And, uh, Clearly. <laughs> I, uh, thank you for coming on, really. I enjoyed oh, your stories good. very much. Well, I, uh, I, I'm just so truly honored to be here. You you guys have guests on. At, uh, you know, like John Salk, I've, I've met him. I, I know his son. His son actually works for the city of Troy and City Hall. and Or was. He actually recently left. Salka, and, uh, Salka, you know, Salka. To, be, to be able Salka. to come on this show with, with guys that you have on of that caliber is uh, it's humbling. Very humbling. Well, I can truly say, listen to your stories. You are one of them, Chief. I appreciate it. Thank you. You don't have to be from the FDNY to have a great oh, career like you have. Yeah. Yep. And, yeah. and uh, we're going to try to get out there a little more and get guys from all over the country. That's great. Yeah, we're man. getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Email us. Email us your email us your salty, right. crusty guys. Yeah. yeah. And, and maybe a contact number instead of just saying, hey, you know, you should get on this guy. I'm like, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you got his number? No. If I had a I'm nickel like, for everybody time, every time well, I've, I've written, right. you know, does yeah. he watch the show? Does he want to come on? He's like, well, I don't know him. I'm like, dude, uh, well, you know, know. My time. Right. Yeah. I'll kill somebody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. All Unfortunately, right. Uh, Petey, you got my, uh, yep. I want to do my shout out. Cool. Oh, I'm going to okay. do, do the Bells. Uh, 
Oh, Unfortunately, no. this was New Haven firefighter, 27-year-old Thomas. I hope I say his last name. My, Miley's? Miley's. Um, believe he got into an accident beginning of the, this month. Um, he's only been on since January, so he was a probing. But uh, he got into an accident on I-95. And, um, you know, I've, this was one of my pet peeves on the job, and I'm not, I'm not Monday morning quarterback in anything, but I've told my daughter this, both my daughters, if you get into an accident on the highway I don't, or you get a flat tire on the highway, you don't pull over to the side. You, you draw, I don't care if the rim falls off, if the, you, you ride on the brake, you get off the highway because, you know, again, I don't know all the facts of this, but supposedly there was a few cars and it was, I don't know, I, I don't know what, what happened, but he got hit by a car. Um, that careened off another car, you know, all these, it was at 10 o'clock at night, you know, nothing good is happening. You know, when people are driving 60 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour, drunk, not drunk, you know, and uh, unfortunately he lost his life. So uh, we'll give him the bells. All right. Stand by. <clears throat> Rest, Rest in peace, peace brother. brother. Too young. Too young. Yeah. All right, Ruff. Uh, PD Chief, uh, guys, Chief, have a great holiday. Have a great Thanksgiving. You too, fellas. Have a uh, wonderful Thanksgiving, wonderful Christmas season. Uh, Happy yeah, a lot to be, <laughs> lot to be thankful. <laughs> a lot to be thankful nice. for. I like shalom. that. See, he can do it. Shalom. He, he shalom. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do. I do both. I have Christmas and I have Hanukkah here. So, yeah. You do. Yes. You. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> all right, enough of that. Uh, all right. Now, we're very thankful for, for all you knuckleheads in the chat. We love you guys. Yeah, man. Thank you guys so much tonight. Um, Chief, just hang with us again. We're going to okay. just talk to you at the end. Uh, okay, guys, real quick. Real quick tonight. Audio. We're on all the players. Follow us there. Listen to the show. Listen to it, right? Because we do audio and video right here on YouTube.com forward slash Get Salty Experience, where I will ask you to take – your booger hook off the bang switch and hit that like, subscribe, and share button, please. All right, guys. Also, Salty Dog Inc. is where you can find us, right? At, on Instagram, we're also uh, getting salty experience on TikTok, and there's some good videos there getting a lot of traction, ladies and gentlemen. So, if you're on TikTok, go check it out. Getting salty apparel.com, getting salty apparel.com for all of your firefighter apparel and accessories needs. Uh, Thank you to everyone in the super chat tonight. Holy macaroni. That Holy was guacamole. That was a wild night. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Uh, lots of fun uh, interactions there. We thank you. Uh, guys getting salty fans on Facebook, getting salty fans. Great page. We are 50,000 plus uh, subscribers on there. Uh, a lot of back and forth, a lot of sharing of jabs, a lot of sharing of info, questions, history. It's like a uh, global firewire, I like to call it. So get on there. Uh, getting salty ads at gmail.com if you guys want to advertise with the show, like your buddy, uh, Chief. You well, know, I'll get them. <laughs> you send them over, so, so, send them over to me, and I'll give them my spiel. Uh, getting salty experience at gmail.com. Uh, if you guys want to have uh, email us questions for the show, uh, like for example, I know a guy, his name is Joe Smith. He's a firefighter at, and his phone number is X, Y, Z, uh, and like something That's like crazy. that. You can actually leave a number. That's insane. Yeah. Like give us a blurb about the guy and then tell us mm. who he is. Right. Also guys get Coop's podcast, Coop's podcast at gmail.com for the, uh, Cockloffs and cocktails show. That's our news show. Uh, with all your helmet cam footage, fire photos, uh, fire family photos, uh, hot old lady contests, right? We still have Mrs. Procaccini for the win. Uh, you know, all that good stuff. So hit us up there as well. All right. And that is uh, all the news that's fit to print, boys. All right. We'll see you uh, Monday. We have uh, Thursday. We have uh, Random yeah. Thought. Random uh, Thoughts. Uh, cool. 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 And then... Uh, Thursday, the Monday, the twenty eighth, we have Captain Dale Jenkins, Houston. Is that the guy who had like fifty years on the job, Ruff? 
I think he does have. Uh, yes, I don't remember. He's the, he's the guy. Wasn't he the guy people. that was dead over the JFK assassination or some shit? Holy I think so. Yes. Jesus. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> that would right. be a good, interesting Thanks. one. That's for yes. sure. All right, All right. Guys, that was you on Monday, out. Chief. Thanks again for coming on. Stay on. We'll Thank you, fellas. Catch Thank up you so in much. the uh, in the after show. All right, guys. All right. See you next. Uh, stay low and go. All right, everybody. We'll see you at the big one. Thanks. No one is coming. It's up to us. See you all later.